We're good to go. Seems good. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, today is our regularly scheduled council meeting for June the 12th. Um, as we got gathered together, we just want to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the traditional territories of the Coast and the Strait Salish people. Uh, specifically, we recognize the Lekwungen people, known today as the Songhees and the Esquimalt Nations, and that their connections to these lands and the adjoining waters continues to this day. Up first on the agenda is approval of that agenda. Okay, moved and seconded. Thank you. Uh, any changes or corrections or amendments to the agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed, not opposed, that carries. Uh, we have adoption of the minutes of the regular council meeting of May 23rd. And we move, move approval, thank you, move and second it. Is there any changes or corrections to the minutes? Not seeing any, I will call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed, not opposed. And then adoption of the committee of the whole minutes from May 29th. Moved and seconded, thank you. Uh, again, any changes, corrections, or amendments to those minutes? Not seeing any, all those in favor? Any opposed, none opposed. Uh, mayor's remarks, uh, just first of all, welcome. Uh, we have a significant agenda tonight and I look forward to a fulsome but focused discussion on the topics at hand. Um, just a reminder for anybody watching online that following my remarks will be the public input session section, which allows for comments and on items of interest to the district but aren't necessarily on the agenda tonight. Uh, if you're online and watching the live stream and wish to participate in the public input section, please raise your hand in the Zoom or through the telephone number following the directions in the agenda package. Um, I have to say, warn you up front, my remarks tonight are considerably longer than they usually are. They're usually about 10 seconds long. Um, uh, so we'll get to that. But I also just want to pass on regrets from Councillor Green. Councillor Green wanted to be here tonight, but is a, uh, uh, unable to join us. Where she is traveling does not have sufficient um, uh, access to get remote access to here tonight. So first, I want to just make sure residents are aware of several, several open public input opportunities. Um, we have the annual citizen survey is now open, which it closes on July the 4th. This provides an opportunity for input on key service areas, and this information will help inform the council priorities and budget process in the fall. There's also an accessibility survey, also open, closing on June 23rd. This will help inform the creation and scope of the accessibility committee and the accessibility priorities in coming years. And finally, the draft annual report is posted online for public review. This will be coming to council for consideration on June 26th. Um, we also have a couple of upcoming uh, community events. We have the first of the night markets coming up this Wednesday, and we have the Spring Nosh, which is happening is it Saturday or Sunday this week? Saturday this week from 11 to 4 on Oak Bay Avenue at the uh, Fowl Bay end of the road. Uh, next, I would like to thank the organizers of the Oak Bay Tea Party for another successful event last weekend. Uh, I appreciated the first ever performance of the Lekwungen Dancers to open the stage for the weekend and the performance of two Ukrainian groups uh, who were invited that were refugees and uh, brought their talents over from Ukraine. Thanks to Saanich Mayor Dean Murdoch, who helped raise almost 24000 with me for the Victoria Hand Project to set up two prosthetic clinics in Ukraine and for being a great sport uh, in racing giant teacups in heavy wind off the beaches of Oak Bay. Uh, next, I would like, to, oh, uh, yes. I also just want to touch base on the uh, First Nations initiatives. Um, I would like to just express my appreciation for the many councillors who were able to attend the two meaningful recent events related to First Nations economic development. Uh, Oak Bay had by far the most attendance of any municipality in the CRD at those. Uh, first was opening of the Indigenous Business Directory, which was held at the Songhees Wellness Centre. And the second was a flotilla gathering of First Nations boats and on-sea technologies in support of their work in the blue economy. <clears throat> it was great to see the initiatives and cooperation demonstrated by the various First Nations. I also had to leave that one early to attend another meeting, so I just want to say thank you to Councillor Patterson, uh, who stepped up and said a few words on behalf of Oak Bay at that event, so thank you for that. <clears throat> on a more fundamental note, I'm very pleased to announce that Gary Norman Sam, who's a councillor for Songhees Nation, has agreed to take on the position of the District of Oak Bay's First Nations Guide. This is a part-time advisory role. Uh, work has already begun, and we look very much forward to his helping inform relations with the Squamalt and Songhees Nations and in following a respectful community path towards reconciliation. Next, I would like to recognize the mass bike ride. If you came in, today, in the front door today, you probably noticed a big cadre of bikes uh, organized in support of cycling infrastructure. 
Uh, I don't want to minimize the complexity and cost of coordinating underground asset replacement with above ground amenity work. It is worth noting that funding and planning work underway will allow the district to be opportunistic and responsive in building a new infrastructure, uh, hopefully significant amounts in the next two to three years. Uh, for instance, in the immediate future, three key projects are finalizing. There's a 2023 upgrade of the 2011 after transportation plan. Uh, completion of that will allow for detailed designs uh, and grant applications for those projects. Uh, also, the redesign of the McNeil corridors and active transportation corridor is coming back for consideration uh, before summer, both of those, and assuming the design of the McNeil corridor is approved, that uh, work is expected to complete before the end of the calendar year. Uh, so we're very much looking forward to seeing these and other projects move forward, and I appreciate Council's support of active transportation initiatives, both in the budgeting and the strategic planning process. Next, sorry, I told you there was a lot tonight. I would like to celebrate the reopening of the Oak Bay branch of the library and encourage people to visit. While there are a few finishing touches still to come, it is noticeably brighter and the space is much more, more flexible to meet evolving needs. Uh, I want to give a special thank you to Oak Bay and GVPL, uh, the Great Victoria Public Library, facility staff who have worked so well together to see the work completed. I also want to thank the staff at the Monterey Centre who have successfully hosted a long pop-up library, I think the longest in library history, over the last few months as the asbestos remediation and renovations have been underway. Uh, so I also would like to say to the Great Victoria Public Library Board Chair, who happens to be this man, Councillor Andrew Appleton, um, please pass on our appreciation to the board for their support during the renovation. Next, I'd like to touch on a couple of subjects from the CRD just to give some updates. Um, there is a public health office recently uh, came and provided an update on public health issues to the Capital Regional Hospital District, as they are required to do under our agreement with them. Uh, and from that discussion, there was a lot of discussion on the toxic drug supply and uh, raised was the question of how the regional district and municipalities might help with the toxic drug supply addiction and other drug use issues in our communities. So they're gonna, gonna, gonna be coming back and that may germinate some ideas of how we might at a local level uh, help. Uh, and that ties to a broader regional discussion around safety through community design. Uh, this is an initiative primarily focused on violence reduction but touching on many areas of safety. Uh, it's likely to be a CRD-wide discussion in the coming year, and uh, the CRD has at least provisionally agreed to put in some money to help facilitate that discussion and uh, work with the municipalities in the region, as well as police, healthcare providers, educational institutes, and more. So we'll probably expect to see some more of that next year. Second to last, and also related to community safety, I'd like to comment on the recent decision by the Board of Education for School District 61 and the Police School Liaison Officer Program. Uh, in and around Oak Bay, this impacts Willows and Margaret Jenkins Elementary Schools, Monterey Middle School, and Oak Bay High. And as I'm sure you're aware, uh, there's been a lot of strong public reaction to that decision. Uh, as chair of the Oak Bay Police Board, I can share that the police board has a similar responsibility to the school board in ensuring the services provided meet community needs and values. And as such, the Oak Bay Police Board made a submission to the school district offering to continue the school liaison program while also working with the school board to ensure the school liaison program adapts to meet current and future concerns, needs, and opportunities. Tonight, I will just note that it is still possible for the school board to defer their decision, to give time, time to work with police boards in the region to reimagine what a school liaison officer can be, time to understand how police and education fit into the broader community safety initiative discussion underway, time to see how police boards and school boards can work together to advocate for needed provincial resources, and time to establish stronger school board to police board relationships to best meet emergency, emerging community needs. Last, I promise is the last topic tonight, but not least, I had the chance to attend a rally at the legislature to raise awareness of the ongoing war in Ukraine and the ecocide caused by the Russian bombing of the Karkova Dam. And in speaking with several of the Ukrainian refugees there, I was reminded of something that I think bears repeating, and I know we think about it a lot, but we don't often talk about it, namely that democracy is fragile and requires constant work to keep healthy. For example, as Russian President Putin recently uh, did to consolidate power, he just removed the last of the independent powers of municipalities. And municipalities are often the closest to the constituents they serve, are the most accountable, and the most democratic. It's no surprise to see an authoritarian, st authoritarian state take over municipal decision-making under the guise of an emergency, but a reminder of the critical nature of the work we do around this table. Our work is important, not just for the decisions we make, which directly impact people's lives, but also as an example of effective democracy. 
We are held and hold ourselves to an extraordinarily standard of transparency and accountability, and we do this through open and respectful debate, responsiveness, attention to detail, respect for expert advice, respect for public input, and so much more. So as we undertake our work tonight, and I know I'm, we're getting started a little later than usual, thanks to my, my long talk, I want to remember how we are lucky to have the system that we have, but also how we must continually work to be examples of good governance. In this spirit, I want to take this moment to say how much I appreciate the value each member of this council and the value of each of you here bring to this table through your hard work, respectful tone, and your unique experience, knowledge, and opinions. It's what makes our local democracy work, and with that, Let's get to work. Item number six on the agenda is the public comment and question period. This is an opportunity for members of the public in attendance at the meeting, either in person or remotely, to address council uh, on issues of, uh, of interest to them and to the district. Uh, speakers should be aware that video recordings, of course, are made of council meetings and are therefore streamed live and archived in the municipal website. So with that, I'll make a call. Is there anybody in the audience or online who wishes to address council? Not on items on the agenda, if you're here for that, but for other items of general interest. Uh, I'm looking online, and I'm looking in the audience. Anybody in the audience wishing to come forward? I already asked if people online wanted to could raise their hands at the beginning of this, so I'll make a final call. I see primarily staff and applicants online, so believe there will not be any public input, which is not unusual, but it's always nice to have people coming forward. Uh, up next, we have reports and memorandums from Committee of the Whole. Uh, this is item 7.1, Upl Uplands Sewer Separation, the Humber Catchment Project. I will note that this is, a, uh, is subject to public input. There was public input also provided at the Committee of the Whole. Uh, but if anybody wishes to address us on this issue, uh, please indicate that now by raising your hand online or uh, I'll call for that in person here in a few minutes. Um, I'm not sure if staff wish to provide an overview or if the report and pieces come from it. We'll just leave it there. So members of council, we had this uh, sat at the Committee of the Whole. Uh, this body recommended, for those who are interested, Committee of the Whole sits as a non-legislative body. And so we debate in a more informal setting and make recommendations to this body, which sits as a legislative body. And so uh, we, nothing gets moved forward to action until this body moves it forward. So the recommendation here is a series of pieces related to the Humber Cashment Project. We can certainly take the motion as a whole. Uh, I will make the recommendation, move the recommendation from staff. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion on this item? All right, again, lots of discussion at the previous meeting. This is just the uh, essentially moving it forward for action. Uh, all those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. Thank you. Uh, moving on to item number eight. Uh, this one section does not have public input. It's just related to the Housing Supply Act and a pro uh, an opportunity to provide an update on what's happening. Uh, Mr. Bull, our Director of Community Building and Planning, why don't you provide uh, a brief verbal overview? Thanks, Your Worship. Um, um, this report is for information only today, um, and it, um, um, it gives Council an update on the uh, on a notice we received from the province, uh, notice of housing target assessment, and that kind of a notice is something new. It's related to the Housing Supply Act, which is a new act from last fall, and the Housing Supply Act gives uh, the province and the range of new uh, um, tools uh, to um, to in encourage and in increase uh, housing production. So the Housing Supply Act um, uh, is focused on uh, uh, enabling the province to set housing targets and um, work with municipalities to uh, to uh, achieve those goals um, initially through information and reporting requirements, uh, but also the act also includes some other tools for the province down the road if that were ever needed uh, related to uh, appointing advisors or um, receiving recommendations for what a municipality could do. And eventually, uh, if need be, uh, the province also has the ability now to uh, intervene in the municipality's bylaw making and permit issuing powers. Um, on May 31st, the first 10 municipalities were uh, announced. Uh, there's uh, 47 in total that already are listed in an ordering council from the province. Um, a number of criteria have been used to select these communities. Uh, the criteria are attached to the uh, report. We haven't received any information just yet on what the scores uh, might be for Oak Bay. Um, let me see. 
So the province was intending to meet with us this month. Uh, uh, however, we did receive um, a notice uh, last week that it uh, needed to be a, a little bit later. So they're intending to meet with us early July. Um, and um, what they intend to do uh, as part of that housing target process is consult with us um, in, a, in a series of meetings with staff initially, um, giving us uh, getting our input, but also gets eventually then give the draft or the housing target order. On our part, we intend to bring that back to council once we have more clarity on that, so council also has a chance to decide if, if, if you want to weigh in. Um, so yeah, the, the focus of the province, as, as stated in the letter, is to assist local governments in speeding up local approval processes through um, the continued implementation of a development approvals process review and the province's own work on digitizing and accelerating their own provincial permitting processes. Um, in, this, in the report, we also notice, note that uh, some of this information does align with a project that the district is already working on, like infill housing and in the future uh, also village area planning. Uh, but we note that uh, infrastructure and uh, capacity of the organization are key constraints to, uh, uh, to move fast. Uh, let me see. Yeah, I'll leave it at that, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bowen. Are there any questions of staff on this report? Go ahead, Councillor Smart. Uh, thank you. Um, through you, Mayor, to Mr. Bull. I, I just wanted to ask about the comment about capacity of infrastructure. Uh, it was my understanding from previous conversations, and this, I granted, may be more of an engineering question, so you <laughs> don't, um, but that it wasn't a capacity issue with our infrastructure and that we weren't concerned um, with how our infill housing would impact capacity, but it was rather that all of our infrastructure is, is old and needs to be refreshed. And I just wanted to clarify if, if that had changed. Mr. Bull, we don't have engineering in the room with us here, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to cover uh, what I know about it. Um, I, I think the note was made in the report because um, uh, we don't know exactly what the housing target will be like or what the announcement will be down the road later this uh, fall. And, but from the uh, in early indications we got with the discussion about uh, four units per parcel, that, that is uh, order number six even. Uh, but uh, some of that is, um, it sounds uh, very uh, much more ambitious than I think some of the uh, plans that, that we have been considering as a more incremental approach. And, and uh, the incremental approach does not run into capacity issues, but uh, a more wholesale, a much more ambitious program might. That is something that would need to be followed up on later, once we know if that's, if that's how it will play out later. Thank you, Mr. Bull. Councillor Smart, anything else? Uh, just one more question through you, Mayor. Just with regards to, I didn't specifically see um, the urban village planning as part of this report, and apologies if I missed it, but I just wanted to clarify it, if it was potentially potentially part of the half application. Mr. Bull? Uh, yeah, the half application, that's the Housing Accelerator Fund, uh, that the, the fe it's a federal grant program staff is in the process of uh, preparing an application for that. Um, as part of that, um, the, the municipalities need to put forward a housing action plan, and that include, in our case, uh, at least seven initiatives. That includes village area planning as one of the projects that we already had on our uh, work plan. Uh, so yes, that's included. Thank you. Councilor Braithwaite. Um, thanks so much, Mayor. Um, I know that um, when Ms. Williams and I met with the minister in regards to this, that he mentioned six months um, as a time frame for us to be doing something on. So I'm assuming that now that they've bumped it up to July and not doing something in June, that it will be six months from the time of that meeting. Is, is that correct? Do we know, Mr. Bull? Yeah, for the mayor, my understanding is those six months uh, st start when, when the housing target is confirmed. So it should be still a while out. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Mayor, and through you to uh, Mr. Bull. Uh, thanks for the update on the information, Mr. Bull. I know that it's uh, limited <laughs> information at best right now, but um, I, I do know that as part of the act that it um, that before making a housing target um, for a specified municipality, the minister must consult with the municipality 
and provide a description of the housing target and provide the opportunity for the municipality to com comment. So I guess this is a twofold question. One is in the initial meeting that uh, staff will be having with the province, it, will that be part of the discussion? Um, and when they talk about provide opportunity for the municipality to comment, do we have any clarity around? Um, is that a is that c for council to comment? Is it for public engagement with the with the residents in the municipality? Do we have any clarity around that? Go ahead, Mr. Bull. Yeah, through you, uh, Mayor. Um, Definitely, it is this upcoming uh, process that the province is embarking on is, is that consultation phase. Uh, we, we didn't get a lot of details just yet. It's definitely consultation with staff. Um, um, as I mentioned, we, we intend to bring that back to council as well. I think it's a very important discussion. Uh, in what, to what extent the province allows for or envisions other types of further consultation with the community, I, I don't know yet. So uh, we'll have to hear that uh, at the first meeting. Thank you very much. I just have one uh, question. Not seeing any other hands here on the. Um, I know that we're doing a sort of a, a, a time balance between our application for the housing accelerator fund funding and the uh, the provincial process, and we're trying to align our targets with what the province wants to set and what our half application. So does this delay from the province change, or will we have those provincial targets in time for inclusion in our housing accelerator fund application, or does, are we just? going to have to move forward separately with the Housing Accelerator Fund. Mr. Bull? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, uh, um, I, I believe there for the deadline of the Housing Accelerator Fund, uh, I think for that one there was a bit more extra time before the submission needs to be submitted. So it's, I don't have the timelines uh, clear yet because we don't know when the province will issue that housing target. So for now we're proceeding with the preparation of the Housing Accelerator Fund application just uh, based on our own goals and uh, expectations of what uh, we'd like to submit. Okay, thank you for that. All right, uh, move no seat. decision? Yep, thank you. Move for seat. Is there a seconder? Thank you. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Uh, this is not for public input, so I don't see any. All those in favor? Any opposed? Not opposed? That carries. Uh, we move to item number nine, which is Statement of Financial Information. We have Ms. McCarran, our Deputy Director of Financial Services, here with us tonight. Um, welcome, Ms. McCarran. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this evening, I'm going to present the 2022 Statement of Financial Information in draft form for Council uh, approval. Basically, uh, the Statement of Financial Information includes the audited statements, which you have already uh, approved in the May 8th meeting. And in addition to that, there's additional disclosure in five other schedules. One uh, records the debt schedule, which is part of your audited statements. Then there's also a schedule for guarantees, a schedule for uh, remuneration and expenses for mayor, council, and staff. There's also a schedule for any severance agreements that occurred or commenced in 2022. And finally, there's a schedule of payments to suppliers. And also, in addition to uh, disclosing that information, the uh, statement of financial information also um, satisfies uh, section 168 of the charter community charter. So with that, I would just like to uh, move that the draft report be uh, accepted as uh, received. Thank you very much. And just uh, procedurally here, if anybody online wishes to address council on the statement of financial information, please raise your hand in the application. And if you're in the room here, I'll make a call towards the end of this section and see if anybody in the room wishes to address us. Uh, so I have my Councillor Patterson, I believe. Yes, thank you very much for uh, the report. And um, I did notice in in the report that uh, certainly Island Asphalt was one of the um, was one of the biggest contracts this year. So I trust that that bodes well <laughs> for the amount, the amount of capital work that has been done. And, and so that's just a comment. But I noticed that that's a significant increase over previous years. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Uh, are there other questions? Or go ahead, Councillor Braithwaite. Um, thanks so much. I noticed that on um, number eight, taxation, um, th and you might not be able to answer this, but I did notice that there was a very large increase in BC Transit, mm -hmm. like seven percent increase over last year. Mm -hmm. Is there is 
uh, is there was it was it similar to the year prior to that? Was there a very large increase? Do you remember? Because I, do I don't remember. Yeah. I can find that out for you. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, when you look at that, I mean, everything else stayed pretty similar, I think. Um, but when you look at the bottom line, it looks like the taxation that we brought in is about point one or point two percent lower than the taxation that we have to give out to those entities. Mm -hmm. And I found that interesting because I was wondering how that was in comparison to other years. Thank you. So don't have an answer for that. I, I can probably uh, answer it in general terms. Um, it is a substantially larger increase this year. Mm -hmm. uh, it reflects a couple of things, a settlement of the, uh, of the union agreement and a uh, reduction in gas taxes and um, some operational cost increases that, that captured it. Um, that being said, that percentage is actually lower than the overall because, again, much like other jurisdictions, it's shared as a combination of population and land value. And uh, with some of the growth that happened last year in some of the Western communities, they actually absorbed a higher percentage of that. Um, that being said, they also saw substantive investment in new uh, infrastructure, new high occupant, no, uh, uh, rapid transit lines were uh, were started, and uh, quite a few new uh, new infrastructure pieces were built in the Western communities to service that growth. So it is, in many ways, proportional and fair. But yes, that it was uh, quite a quite a different jump this year. And 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 just for council's awareness, the the projected increases as a couple of those fun as alternate funding sources are coming to an end, um, the municipalities will be picking up a higher percentage of the overall uh, transit tax, and so the transit increases are likely to exceed the actual operational cost increases over the coming two or three years. So, fair warning. Go ahead, Councillor Smart. Uh, thank you. Through you, Mayor, uh, to staff. Uh, I, in light of the amazing event that many of us attended on Wednesday celebrating the online directory of Indigenous businesses, I did have the opportunity to chat with some staff at the City of Victoria around um, economic development and their direction to invest in Indigenous uh, businesses. Um, and I and I just wanted to ask um, uh, staff if um, I understand the city of Victoria doesn't have a policy, but it's more of an understanding. And so I wanted to ask staff if if that is something that they would need further direction on from council in which to encourage the um, uh, investing in our indigenous economy, or if that's something that staff would naturally take up with our uh, council priorities. Sure. I'm not sure who to give that to, to uh, Ms. Williams or Ms. McCarran. This is really related to procurement policies and um, yeah, the way that we are. We have some social uh, policy pieces within our procurement policy, but I'm not sure if you're prepared to answer the specifics here tonight or not. Um, Ms. McCarran? I, I can answer that we would follow council priorities on that, and so we would follow your direction and your recommendations on that matter. Thank you. I don't think we have anything specific in our policies that, that lays out sort of the, the conditions where exceptions would be made on behalf of that. So that may be something we consider as part of it. Ms. Williams, did you want to add anything? Your finger's close to your button, that's all I should. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. No, I was just going to say we can take that away and I can talk to the Director of Finance about uh, an amendment to our procurement policy to incorporate some, some of that social contract. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see a lot of other questions popping up here. Uh, move receipt. I move approval, actually. Oh, sorry, move receipt first. Yes, thank you, move receipt. Uh, before I call the question on receipt, though, I will open it up again, call if anybody in the audience wishes to talk to Council about our Statement of Financial Information report. Obviously, that's not what you're here for. Um, we'll, and nobody online has indicated they wish to speak. Is that correct? Nobody? Okay. So I'm prepared to call the question on the receipt of the report. All those in favor? Any opposed, not opposed, and the second part of the uh, recommendation to be um, approved. Move approval. Seconded. Any further discussion? Yeah, go ahead, Councillor Watson. Yes, sorry, I'm through you, Mayor. I forgot to ask a question, and if I could just do that now to Ms. McCarran, please, through you to Ms. McCarran. Um, this report, I just wanted to understand, it is approved by us and then it is filed, uh, and um, I just wanted to know who it's filed with and how this relates to the electronic filing that we do with the local, under the Local Government Act. Are these two independent things, or how do they work together? Ms. McCarran, can you turn your microphone on? Yeah, you. Through you, Mayor. 
Yes, it is filed with the same uh, entity, provincial, and our LDGE, which is the basic filing of uh, our income statement and balance sheet statement of financial position, that's all filed. And then the SOPI, we follow up by June 30th to present all this additional disclosure. Thank you very much. Uh, for those who are interested in some of the inner workings of the municipality, the, uh, the SOFI report with all of the payor payees and, and salaries and so forth, that's created a pretty, sort of a pretty, pretty interesting picture that you don't necessarily see in the, in the higher level financial reporting. Not seeing any other comments or questions, I will call the question. All those in favour? Any opposed? None opposed? That carries. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Karen, for the report. Uh, and if you want to leave, I think you're allowed to leave at this point. You're more than welcome to. Um, we have up now number 9.2, which is the amended reciprocal fire services mutual and automatic aid agreement. We have Mr. McDonald, our fire chief, here with us this evening. Uh, welcome, Mr. McDonald, our chief McDonald. Uh, good evening, Your Worship and, and members of council. Uh, thank you for having me here tonight. And uh, as you uh, outlined, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, you know, the subject uh, before us is the amended reciprocal fire services mutual an automatic aid agreement. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, I think previously when this has been before council, the short-term version was the tri-party agreement, which is a little easier to uh, digest. Um, good news story before us tonight where uh, we're looking to ultimately make it a four-core agreement. So um, it's a great opportunity. So when, um, when this original report was before council in January of 2021. It, it uh, originally involved uh, the District of Oak Bay, just District of Saanich, and the City of Victoria. Um, we are now in an opportunity where um, the City of Esquimalt would like to join. Um, there's no uh, material change to the agreement other than the addition of uh, the City of Esquimalt. So uh, there's, there's nothing substantive with regards to um, a significant change to any of the operational aspects or indemnification aspects to the agreement. It's, it's really just uh, adding uh, the, the new party. Um, you know, it, it is a tremendous opportunity and a, and a, and a great thing. Um, you know, going back, when, when you look at, at the four core agreement that originally was in place, it was in, um, in place in the early 1980s. Uh, so that's an extremely dated agreement. Um, there was work within the four core to update that agreement. We weren't over, able to get over the finish line uh, until uh, till now, but you know, had substantially gone through a major rebuild uh, that led to the tri-party agreement and has been brought up into the modern fire services era with regards to having seamless uh, mutual aid and auto aid arrangements, which really make for um, seamless and efficient operations for, for fire departments. Uh, the, the the key piece is really just to that that council authorize the the amended reciprocal uh, mutual and, and automatic aid agreement with the city of Victoria, the district of Sanchez, and township um, of Esquimalt, and um, look forward to uh, answering uh, any questions that uh, anyone may have. Thank you very much, Chief. Are there any questions of Chief McDonald? Go ahead, Councillor Patterson. And then Councillor Watson. Yes, thank you, Mayor, and through you to Chief McDonald. Thank you for the um, presentation on the mutual aid agreement. I am wondering about the, um, as densities increase in the municipalities and as buildings get taller, how is that taken into consideration with responding with these reciprocal aid agreements? Chief McDonald. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, yeah, excellent question, uh, Councillor, and I, th I think um, as, as you're familiar, um, or as all members of Councillor are familiar, we've recently gone through a fire master plan. Um, a, a lot of our neighbouring jurisdictions are going through um, mass fire planning or fire service review process. I know the City of Victoria is just at the finish line right now. Uh, District of Saanich uh, recently finished one. And um, I know the fire chief in the city of Esquimalt is, is interested, but you know I can't comment on where they're at with with, with going there. But processes like that really, um, you know, start with the, the the local jurisdiction to determine uh, you know what their risk is, what their staffing is, um, and then look at ways that you know we can um, work as as a um, to support those service levels through either mutual or auto aid uh, processes. So the, the beauty of this type of agreement is um, we have the ability to be somewhat flexible as risks change um, and 
you know this agreement after five years does renew on a on an annual basis so it allows us to you know continuous review and update and there is a standing committee that typically meets uh, every three to four months uh, so we are um, constantly um, addressing risks as well as reviewing our our, um, our policies uh, to support effective fire response so. thank you chief uh, before I go to Councillor Watson I just want to remind anybody online that wishes to talk to us about this mutual aid agreement uh, this is the time to put up your hand to indicate you wish to speak because we're going to be going probably to motions fairly quickly uh, I also um, mr. Dowling if I might can we just there's one um, ms. McCarran's laptop is still listed as unmuted on here can we perhaps just mute that uh, so if it uh, opens up again we don't get background noise uh, over to you councillor Watson Thank you, uh, Mayor, and through you to um, uh, Mr. McDonald. Um, uh, first of all, I just wanted to say how comprehensive uh, this, um, uh, this this agreement is with the multiple jurisdictions, and I can see that there was a lot of time taken to figure out all the different elements and make sure that it worked, and it relies on uh, close co uh, cooperation and very clear procedures in every department so that really stood out for me in reading it so it gave me a lot of assurance that we have a good framework in place for getting these additional services when we need them my only question is just about this automatic renewal for the one-year terms and um, I, I understand from what you just said kind of what the purpose of that is but how long does that continue before you actually come to a complete end and you're actually entering into a new agreement so if you could just talk about that those renewal provisions please go ahead chief uh, th uh, through you mr. mayor um, you know excellent question since we haven't got to the end of five years I don't know uh, from a procedural piece um, you know there, there are opportunities where any party you know can serve notice to um, you know pull out or or uh, bring it back to um, I think a uh, a more substantive review and, and I think that's why it is uh, going through for those one year periods after that because you know that is that is getting a long ways out and it is uh, important that uh, over time these agreements do need to come back for for somewhat of a, a major overall especially on the uh, uh, you know the, the indemnification aspect um, you know I'm not sure what I don't want to put um, you know uh, the CAO or, or uh, our director of corporate services on the spot, but I'm not sure if they've got any further clarification on on um, um, you know what might be a trigger for the one year piece. Sure, um, I'll go to Mr. Coates, our director of uh, corporate services. Thank you. Give me a second to trigger your actual title. Ha Coates. Happens to me every day. Uh, uh, thank you, Worship. So I th I think another reason, um, and certainly uh, Chief McDonald has has articulated, I think a lot of the primary reasons around around that and then I think to the question is I think the one-year renewals are more along the lines that if, if it's if there aren't significant issues that come forward it will just carry on but it sort of creates a bit of an annual check-in that in the event that there is some opportunity to, to to bring new information into the into the considerations and I assume too that it would really only take one of the four participants to trigger a broader discussion so it's sort of if it's not broke don't fix it and it, it might continue on and, and then uh, instead of it being indefinitely that there's the one-year check-in thank you I'm gonna ask a question and I don't want a long answer so if there's not an easy way of answering it then please don't bother but I am curious I my understanding was that Esquimalt had a mutual and automatic aid agreement with the Department of National Defense just given their situation does this agreement draw that entity into the broader one or is that still standalone as a separate one-on-one -on -one agreement or does that I, I don't need to go into details on, the, on what that agreement is I'm just curious if it gets drawn into this agreement as well uh, short answer there's no crossover whatsoever it's totally separate perfect nice short answer thank you shorter than my question uh, yeah go ahead Councillor Braithwaite um, thanks um, so if with the one-year um, ability to um, or, or to renew for one year does that mean you can opt out with a one-year as well uh, through uh, his worship um, so first off you have to get through the, the, the initial five-year term yeah and, and then there is the ability to uh, essentially you know serve notice um, but you know I think if ultimately um, for a lot of things if, if there's an operational um, aspect to it that is going to trigger a substantive uh, review it's it's in mutual um, interest to all parties so they will most likely be consensus on it 
Thank you. I don't see any members of the any members of the public here wish to address us on the mutual aid agreement question. Anybody online wish to address us on the mutual aid agreement question? Not seeing any. I'll come back to this table. Can I have a motion to receive the report? Moved and seconded. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. And then the other uh, recommendation here is that Council authorize the amended reciprocal mutual and automatic aid agreement. Move the staff recommendation, Your Worship. Moved and seconded. Thank you very much. Any further discussion? Not seeing any. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Thank you very much, Chief, for getting us across the finish line. Uh, I know it's a bit of work to get to bring all those bodies together and get agreement on stuff, so thank you. We uh, same, same rule goes for you as Ms. McCarran. If you don't need to be here, you don't have to stay here. Um, with that, item number 9.3 on our agenda, also subject to public input, is uh, municipal office space options and next steps for 1538 Monterey Avenue. We have with us Ms. Bay, our Director of Strategic Initiatives. Uh, we have your important here, uh, Ms. Bay, so perhaps you could provide a brief overview and then I might lay out a little, oh, I'm gonna give it to Ms. Williams, sorry, not Ms. Bay. And then uh, after that, I will, I have some suggestions for perhaps uh, funneling our conversation. Uh, there's a lot of options here that kind of go off in tangents, so I'll try and uh, provide some mechanisms where we can get through this in a reasonably timely fashion. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Williams. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And Ms. Bay is online. Should Council have any questions, uh, that would be better directed to her. We also have uh, Mr. Graham, who is our Manager of Facilities uh, here. Should Council have questions related to renovation or facility itself? Uh, so for, for the purposes of this report, uh, back in January of 2023, Council uh, considered options to address the staffing needs shortage at Municipal Hall. We had, we had a staffing shortage for current and for future staff. And based on the options that were available at the time, Council directed staff to initiate a rezoning application on the, the district-owned property at 1538 <clears throat> Monterey Avenue. And it was anticipated this would be an eight to 10 year window where it would be used as a commercial office space while we awaited uh, construction of a, a municipal facility that was either new or being replaced. Uh, as a part of that conversation, staff committed to, to maintaining an eye on what was available in the market in case an alternative came up and committed to bringing that back to council if it was a viable option uh, and the rezoning hadn't already uh, proceeded and been successful. So we've brought this back to you this evening for that purpose. Uh, an opportunity to lease commercial space has uh, come up and so we're here to present that opportunity and to ask if council would like to reaffirm the previous decision, in which case we'll continue with the rezoning application and the renovations or or revisit that decision and perhaps use commercial space and take the Monterey house out of the rezoning application process should council choose to abandon the rezoning as, as mayor Murdoch uh, referred there would be a, a, sub, a secondary decision that count that staff is seeking uh, and that's on the future future direction on future use of the Monterey House. So we've provided, uh, I believe it's five options in the report. That's definitely not an exhaustive list of op options. It's some uh, uses that ha it has been used for in past and discussion has happened at this table on uh, some of those options. We do recognize that it might be a bigger discussion than council wants to undertake tonight and, and it may have to be deferred for, for additional information. So Sina is here, or sorry, Mrs. Bay is here and Mr. Graham and I'm here to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Ms. Williams. Uh, I will just let you stick up your hand, Ms. Bay, or open up your video if you want to address council. Um, at this time, I'll come back to this table. This is open for public input. If there's anybody from the public who wishes to address us, you can raise your hand on the online form at this time. And when we get to the public input portion, I will call on you. Uh, at this time, however, I, uh, we can just come to the council table. My suggestion here is um, fairly simple. One is I think the first question I'm just going to kind of go around the table and get a sense of is, is council comfortable with shifting at the commercial use from this building to a, to a commercial offices? It seemed to be the, priority, the primary preference when we first did the go around. Um, and when none was found, we came back to using the house. So I guess that's my primary question. And if there's a quick agreement that that is the piece, I'll, I'll, I'll go around and have a debate on these. I just want to get a sense of, of sort of a process. Uh, so if that's yes, that's fairly straightforward. I think we should give that direction here tonight to allow staff to move forward. Uh, if no, then obviously status quo continues and we move forward. 
Uh, but if yes, then I think there's a couple of questions. One, do we want to continue renovations to the to the building to allow for uh, um, uh, for use as a residential property? And I think Mr. Graham will be helpful here to understand what the what the threshold is to, to make sure it doesn't degrade versus being able to be lived in, and what those costs might be. Uh, and if so, then per perhaps we can nail it down. Do we want just nonprofit uh, options? Do we want market options? Do we want both in terms of some of the rent, if that's the, if that's the determination? And then the third part is under what uh, process do you want to look at the uh, the future use? Is that a standalone highest and best use? Is it you know, looking for it as a residential only piece or is it within the village planning process uh, more large? And so we'll try and get through those. I think we can do it fairly quickly if we kind of step through it in, in process. Um, so I think uh, if I if I don't if you don't mind, I'm just going to kind of circulate around and Councilor Braithwaite indicate you wish to speak to the first part, which is the are we comfortable moving into the commercial space available and changing the direction of this building? Go ahead. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, and through you to um, to staff, I'm assuming that the um, the the space that's available um, is available immediately um, and that we actually have the staff that could go in there immediately or do we still need to hire the staff before we would secure that space? Ms. Williams? Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Uh, the space is available immediately and uh, we don't have all of the staff currently. We have some of the staff in place. A few, st a few of the new staff started last week and the rest are under recruitment. Thank you. Perhaps to that end, just as a follow logical follow-up, though, what would be the start date at the least? Then would that be sort of in July? Ms. Hart, can you can you speak to that, Ms. Williams? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Yes, we are looking at a move-in by the end of this month. Just a follow-up. I, I know that um, in your report you had said that you had considered renting um, trailers to put in the um, in the parking lot, which of course would take up some of the parking spots. But, but would, do you have a cost of what those trailers would have been and how it would how it how it was um, how it would compare to the to the lease amount for the other space? Mr. Graham. Uh, through your worship, the. I want to compare a little bit bigger picture because putting the trailers isn't just the least cost. We'd have to run power data. So if if I look at all the costs together, they're and um, they're they're almost identical. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Thank you, and just to follow up uh, to that, I I do like the option of being able to activate space quickly and. Um, and allow flexibility for the Monterey properties, so I can <laughs> say that out of the gate. Um, but on the, the, the space that is available, uh, are there improvements required? And if so, um, is there a contribution from the landlord or is it the up to the district to pay? I mean, I know that there's always the, the phones and the cabling and all of that, but is there any re reconfiguration of the premises? Mr. Graham. Uh, short answer is no reconfiguration is needed. Um, we're doing some painting and some wall touch-ups that's being done by the landlord, and uh, we're updating some uh, network connections. But other than that, it's move-in ready. Thank you. Go ahead, Councilor Patterson. Yes, and just uh, a follow-up to that, because this um, from the report was, and thank you for the report, um, the, the, uh, the space will um, it was approximately eight individuals, and we need something for 12. So there may be total potential space available to it. Do we have a, a sense of the timing of when additional space would be required? Mr. Graham. Um, historically, short answer is no, we don't have anything because we're. it would have to be um, space that becomes available on the second floor. Historically, once every couple of years, space becomes available. And as part of this lease, we've negotiated in a, um, a, a right of first option on any new space that comes up. So if it does, the landlord will contact us and we can uh, choose to, uh, to add it to our space to make uh, enough for the 12 people that we need or not. So um, it's totally based on market. What, uh, what comes up or what doesn't. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Thank you. And the, the last question, I guess, is for the, for the staffing that we had to upsize for, many of those individuals will have to be um, uh, mobile around the district for capital projects and attending the, the job sites. I'm just wondering about the parking. Is there any parking with the unit? Is there enough 
Uh, is there adequate parking here in overflow at the hall? Um, where do we stand on the parking facilities? Mr. Graham? Um, our initial analysis with personal vehicles is there's there's enough parking around the existing building. Uh, we haven't done a deep dive onto whether we will need an additional staff vehicle for people to get around to the different sites, um, but we do have a couple extra parking stalls that we could utilize locally. Thank you. Are there any other? Yeah, go ahead, Councillor Watson. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. Through you to Mr. Graham, just to follow up on this uh, this. Um, direction this line of questions I wondered if there are any um, uh, uh, risks associated uh, if we go forward with this with the landlord terminating the lease like what are the what are the provisions that might uh, in real estate terms move us out of the premises even if we wanted to stay I just I asked that question because if we do this we're certainly moving all our eggs into a different basket and um, and not following up on a previous plan so I just want to get a sense of it may be an almost infinite small risk but maybe you could just comment on that okay. thank you uh, Councillor Watson go ahead mr. Graham uh, I was very careful in the lease negotiations really the only way that we could be uh, moved out is if we don't pay our rent on time thank you Okay, I think uh, I haven't heard anybody expressing disinterest in moving this uh, forward into the space. So I'm, I'm not making any motions just yet, if that's okay. I think I'll do the, just, the motions may be cascading, um, but that's that's helpful, I think, for all of us to have a sort of clarity of, of our purpose. Moving on to the next question. Um, so the next question here is really, um, does council want to look at residential use in the short term or short to medium term? Um, Mr. Graham, I, I sort of raised the question at the beginning. I might as well just ask it. Do we have a sense of what the difference is? Like, what is required to turn the building into so it doesn't actually, you know, degrade further and 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 maintain that? Or is and th there's a total cost we have or an estimate for renovation to bring it up to standards uh, as a livable space. Can you perhaps do you have a sense of what the gap is? Uh, Three Your Worship, that's a little bit of a loaded question because um, my question back would be what life cycle analysis do I need to consider? Are we looking at a short term, two to three years, or are we looking for a longer term? My initial um, life cycle analysis on the previous reports um, back in January were for like 10 or more years for use, or 20 years even. Uh, if we're looking at tying this into the village plan and it might be two to three years, my life cycle analysis would be totally different on how I approach um, renewals of different systems. Okay, I appreciate that answer. Um, thank you. So, and this, again, this might lead us to taking a bit of a deferral on some of these questions and coming back, uh, but I want to make sure we get all the questions on the table, so if we do that, if we do that, then uh, we come back with those answers at, w at one time. Uh, thank you for that. Councillor Smart, go ahead. Thank you. Um, through you, Mayor, to staff, I wondered if um, staff could just comment on the number of years to uh, break even on, on the rent for the renovation costs for both nonprofit and market rent. Do we have a sense of what market rent is currently for the house? I was. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, we, we, we haven't uh, done an analysis on what we would achieve uh, through a market rent on that property. I did look earlier today at what we know from a nonprofit perspective. Uh, we would probably uh, generate about $1,100 a month in revenue from the property. So looking at the, the numbers in the report where we have a $315,000 cost for the residential renovation, so that's the urgent and the residential uh, renovations, uh, we would be looking at a, a loss of about 301000 if we left it for a two-year term and rolled it into the village area plan. If we looked at it on a cost recovery basis, we'd be looking at around 24 years. Uh, market rent, if you looked at 3,500, and, and that's really just a number I just pulled out of my hat. Uh, if, again, you're looking at rolling it into the village area plan in two years, you're looking at around $275,000 in loss uh, for the 315,000 we would put out up front, or uh, seven and a half years if you wanted to go to a break even point. Subject only to the initial $315,000 in costs. And ignoring maintenance costs and so forth attached to that pieces. So very rough numbers. I think that with a big grain of salt. I might suggest if that analysis wants to be done, we might, again, make that question to staff and have them come back. And I don't know if that should come back in an in-camera portion or not. To, to, if there's specifics attached to an agreement, say, with a uh, non-profit society, that they don't want that shared out. But I will leave that uh, to the advice of staff. Go ahead, Councillor Smart. 
Uh, through you, Mary, I just wanted to comment. I, I don't need further analysis on that. It's so far from cost recovery. I just wanted to get a sense. Thank you. Well, thank you, Worship. But uh, further to that that line of questioning, uh, if I get this right, um, if Council's direction was to shorten the functional time for the building, essentially pending the village plan, the current estimate of three hundred fifteen thousand would be lesser because it's it's going to it, the current estimate of three hundred fifteen thousand is for ten years ish or plus, so we would need to direct staff to provide a revised estimate for the actual cost of renova essential renovations and residential renovations if we chose to run a shorter period of occupancy based on occupancy by a nonprofit organization. Do I, do I have that correct? Graham? Uh, exactly correct. I would uh, be treating uh, system renewals differently, um, taking higher risk on uh, repairs, and it would reduce the budget significantly if we were looking for a, a two to three year period. Thank you for that. Uh, any other questions related to the, uh, the question of do we want to use it for residential use in the short term as we undertake other considerations? Go ahead, Councillor Smart. Um, through you, Mayor. Um, uh, the question is if we uh, did go ahead with option three and then got results from what that highest and best use study was, we then could, as a council, decide to, after having that all that information in front of us, um, uh, take up the leasing residential option. Is that correct? I'm not sure who to direct that question to. Ms. Williams? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, yes, depending on the outcome of the highest and best use and what, what kind of a term Council would be looking at to achieve that, there might be a discussion around a residential uh, use in that, in that interim, for sure. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go first time speaker, so I have Braithwaite and then Smart and then Watson, sorry. Um, thank you. Um, just kind of going along that, I mean, uh, it could be that best use is to do nothing. I mean, that could be something that would come out of the report. I mean, it, not that anybody would want in this housing market to leave a house that was n that did not have tenants in it of some sort, whether it's a nonprofit or a, a market um, a market rate. But um, I, I think because I I look at the highest and best use and I go, okay, but it d does that fall into there? Would 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 nothing doing nothing with that property and wait awaiting the um, the village area plan? Would that could that be an option in there as well? I guess, Mr. Graham, the predetermination is that a possibility? Uh, any any concept planning or best use planning, uh, the, the do nothing option is is always on the table. So d leaving it as existing would definitely be a consideration, and a, an, a, an analysis would be done. All right, thank you, All right, Councillor Watson. Thank you, uh, Mayor, and through you to Mr. Graham. This is kind of a, a, a sort of, um, I need a, a refresher, kind of real estate 101. But when we say highest and best use, I guess I'd just like a little, uh, f you to fill me in a little bit. So this is a market concept. But I wondered how the market concept works uh, uh, in the absence of a policy framework guiding the possibilities of what could occur there. So the market has to make decisions based on a regulatory framework. So if we, if we did highest and best use studies today, what would that regulatory framework be that the, the market was looking at? I think for the lay people listening, your question is, without a village area plan that contemplates a change there, how do you make those pieces? Mr. Graham? Uh, we would have to uh, come back to you and ask for what, what criteria you were looking for. It, it could be a, a redevelopment. I mean, from engineering technical standpoints, just about anything's possible, right? Uh, however, what our, what our criteria and our, and our, our decision-making guidelines would be, the goalposts would definitely need some guidance on. Thank you. Um, okay. I think I had, a, I had a similar question, so that's helpful for me to, to understand that piece. Um, and uh, I guess the last part of my sort of framing of this is really that question is, uh, given if, if there's a use of it in the short term, short medium term, how do we want to adjudicate the possible use of this land? Is it through uh, option three or option four, which is sort of a highest and best use? 
uh, independent of the village planning process or do we look at uh, more in alignment with option five which is within the context of the village planning process and so I think I would just give you a little bit of conversation around that it might be helpful um, as people if there's any questions or comments I'm happy to take them around that that piece yeah go ahead Councillor Smart yeah I, I guess in reading the report my instinct is that we're we're in an atmosphere right now where the whole waiting to do things in the proper order is going to be more harm than helpful and I, I think that it just can't hurt us to have more information and so I think having the highest and best use um, um, study which to me I take to be just options for that site um, it doesn't mean that we immediately need to act on those options but it just gives us more information as we go into our village planning and more information is always better Thank you. I'll go to Councillor Patterson and then Councillor Braithwaite. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I guess I'm leaning towards option five um, because I don't like to leave um, a building vacant in a, in a marketplace where, where housing is so desperately required. So, um, and, and I guess that, that could be either uh, not-for-profit um, housing or, or market, and, and, you know, I, I, I don't know that I have a great deal of preference one way or another, but I I think also I'm leaning towards option five. I think highest and best use, as Councillor Watson said, is really an industry um, term, and it it doesn't fit so well with local government objectives all the time. But I also um, I don't think it's just about highest and best use. I think we would also have to examine potential disposition so that. Perhaps it would be better for the district to dispose of it and have um, and and offer it to the development community who might also bring us ideas. So I think I see option five as a way to to gain use of the house in a temporary manner and uh, still allow us to work forward as a district with the village plan and explore other op options for for the site itself, including disposition. If if so be. Thanks, Councilor Braithwaite. You indicated you wish to speak. Um, yeah, I just uh, we've been talking a little bit about the village plan, and I'm just wondering if staff could perhaps give us an indication on um, how close are we to getting ready to implement a uh, task force or whatever it is that we're going to do around uh, the village plan. Mr. Bull, do you have a timeline for when the initial, uh, you know, sort of options for council to move forward will come forward to council? When does this kick off, I guess, is the question. Yeah, sometime this summer, uh, maybe in July, but might need to be September, that we're going to talk about project sign-off for the village area plan. That will, uh, and that by that time, there should also be more information about uh, housing target, maybe. So yeah, there's a couple of moving parts that will in impact that particular project. Thank you. Thank you. Because yeah, I mean that that, and then the housing targets. I mean, there's so many moving parts with this, and so, and I and I, I don't want us to have our hands tied if we've made a decision, and then other information comes to us, and we go, oh darn, we should have made a different decision. Um, so I, it's it's really difficult right now, and so I think that that's why, you know, getting the um, the highest and best use study might, even if it causes us to, to lose a few months. Um, uh, before we move forward with something. I think, for me, that's where I would feel most comfortable um, being right now. Councillor Watson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, just a comment, and it may lead into, into a question, but um, I just echoing what um, uh, Councillor Patterson said, I, um, I am leaning myself towards option five, but I, um, but I think that in option five, which would take us into a, this comprehensive village planning exercise, that uh, 1531 Hampshire is also part of that. So I'm not sure that I would want to exclude it necessarily from option five right now. I think we hold two valuable pieces of property. What happens to them to achieve the best outcomes for the municipality could be different things, but I, I see them as uh, quite like 1538 Montreal and 1531 Hampshire. So I, I, I don't know what that does to option five as it's currently drafted, but I, I would, um, I guess I would hope, or I'm ex certainly expecting that in the village area planning process, which takes us, 
you know, a step behind the main street into the surrounding neighborhood that, um, that both those properties are kind of part of what we're thinking in our land use planning decision making process and decision making. So I guess it's a comment with no question. Thank you. Hey, Councillor Watson. We all do that. We talk and wonder if we're going to get to a question at the end of it all. Um, I'm going to just speak next, and then I'll come back to second time, third time speakers. Um, you know, my my general feeling on this one is there's there's sort of two considerations. I think that um, I want to put as much uh, emphasis and speed onto the village area planning as I possibly can. I think that it's a critical part of the success of this council term. I think it impacts all kinds of other housing considerations, um, and within that, I think there is some unique situations right now in the village and with these two properties that we own that open up some interesting possibilities. I don't know if they're going to have interest from the public, but um, you know, options like, you know, do we want to say a line theater lane and consider other, you know, transportation options around the village? Do we want to look at uh, additional sort of, uh, you know, structured bike and other kinds of uh, parking or amenities uh, adjacent to um, not by themselves, but perhaps as part of a larger development that might be required if we say use portions of other pieces of municipal property for other purposes. I just think that I want that village plan to go forward as quickly as possible and I want the maximum number of options available to us as possible. So for that reason, I'm really supportive of option five. I just think that, that you know, I, I'm also frankly, I know it's uh, a bit of sunk cost, but I think uh, given that what I understand of the renovations at the house, I, I'm supportive of, of, of renovating it for residential purposes and looking at both market and non-market options. Um, because I think that uh, I, my preference would be to do non-market, but honestly, there may not be a non-market uh, operator that's able to take on a short-term option for it, and it'd be nice to at least understand what the what the ramifications are of that. Um, but I do think, uh, in terms of the uh, the future assessment, especially given the lack of a context of highest and best use, like is that an apartment building? Is it an apartment plus commercial? Is it a uh, is it whatever? That's a very hard decision to make, um, and I do appreciate that word inform a future decision, but I think, again, we're going to be looking at lots of those kinds of pieces together within the village plan that I would I would hope that that would just play one fair part in it. So that's kind of where I'm sitting right now on this piece. Um, uh, go ahead, Councillor Smart. Yeah, thank you, Three Mayor. I guess what I'm hearing around the table um, a little bit is like I'm with the, the timelines that have been discussed for the urban village planning, I, I, I guess I can see option three happening really in, in parallel with the um, village planning, um, with how early it sounds like it could start up by the time they, they have this study going. I really think that it could be quite interactive, and I guess that could be a question um, for staff. Um, but I, I'm quite concerned about um, investing $300,000 in a one or two year short-term rental when we don't know what the province is going to bring us. And I, and I feel like that is an irresponsible decision. And I think even the Intercultural Association, knowing that we were putting $300,000 worth of money into a property for a year or two, not knowing um, if that property is even going to come of interest to the province in our discussions, I just feel like it has a lot of risk. Um, so I'd be much more amenable to re revising option three with some clarity around it interacting with the village planning. And that's just where I'm sitting. Ed, Councillor Appleton. Thank you, Your Worship. And just appreciating Councillor Smart's comments. Again, I, I think it, uh, I, I too wouldn't necessarily favor putting in, you know, the maximum amount of residential renovations at this stage of the game. I think we're, I think we can get a re revised estimate for a shorter term uh, period that fits more with the village planning process. So looking at a, a two to three year timeline for residential renovations rather than a 10 year time frame. So I'd be interested in bringing forward, it's not actually included in the current options, but I think that given the significance that we're placing on integrating this with the village planning process, but potentially also leaving open the options for some type of short-term lease, that we have an understanding of the costs for a more limited residential renovation commensurate with the village planning process timeline. Thank you for that, Councillor Upton. Go ahead, Councillor Braithwaite, then Watson, and then I might uh, try and distill us down to some motions here as well uh, after public input. Go ahead, Councillor uh, uh, yeah, Braithwaite. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I would agree with with those comments of, of my two previous colleagues. Um, I, I can't see throwing putting $300,000 into a, 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 a building like that, and I think Councillor Smart 
uh, said something that really resonated with me is that if the intercultural association knew that we'd put three hundred thousand dollars in for something that they were only going to have for a year and a half they would much rather take a hundred thousand dollar donation from us and use it as they would rather than uh, and we would save two hundred thousand dollars doing that so so I, I I'm leaning towards um, towards the option three as well Thank you. It sounds to me that we would need a revised yeah. assessment from Mr. Graham in terms of what that would, what those costs would be to keep the building from deteriorating further and closing off other options. If that was the case, so we'll have to consider some, some modifications to an amendment or to a motion before we get there. Again, before we get to any motion, this one, I take the last conversation. Go ahead, Councillor Watson. Uh, yes, just thanks, uh, Mayor. Just a few further thoughts about um, uh, village area plan. Uh, these one or two properties, Hampshire and Monterey, and uh, the Housing Accelerator Fund. And I think we've observed that the, um, the th whatever we learn about these properties or any work we do is so closely aligned with what is going to be happening in the village area planning process that maybe it is part of the village area planning process, in which case maybe uh, it's also part of our funding request to have to support that exercise. Uh, because it seems to me that things that we learn from this are going to feed directly into that work. And I think that argument could be made. And so I just, uh, it's just a comment or maybe it's a question to staff at this point I understand that the half application is underway it includes this component if we made a decision to piggyback this on is that something that could be adjusted in the application at this point in time thank you for that I'm just gonna go to the members of the public at this point if anybody wishes to talk to council about this matter happy to take any comments uh, from members of the audience here in the building or at home, and I don't see hands. It's the second time I've made the ask of people at home to raise their hands. I haven't seen any hands raised. If you're on the phone, you would hit star nine to raise your hand uh, through the uh, through the phone. Um, that information is all present on the uh, on the agenda package at the beginning where the phone number is listed. Again, that's star nine. Coming back to this table, I uh, will go to uh, the members in the room here. And uh, so it sounds like, if I might, the option two, uh, which is the basically to, con to convert the uh, one-year lease uh, to a f uh, sorry to move the uh, move to Athlon Court, cease the uh, pieces, and uh, rescind the original decision directing staff to undertake those things, is probably the first order of business that we can uh, deal with. Actually, the first order of business can be received. Uh, move receipt. Moved and seconded. Thank you. Is there any discussion on receipt? All those in favor? Any opposed? Not opposed? Can no, I I'll move option two. I'm assuming that we can make then an additional. We're going to deal okay. with these yeah. instead of stages. If so that's okay. I'll move option two. Moved and seconded. Thank you. Is there any dis further discussion on that? Uh, for those listening to what option two is, it is just the uh, essentially shifting our intention of using our, the building for commercial purposes and, and moving to a, a commercial lease, uh, and then rescinding the original order to, to invest that money in the, in the rezoning. No further discussion. All those in favor? Any opposed? Unopposed? That carries. So then we're on to the other options, which are of less urgency, I will say. But I think we can probably at least direct information back to this body, uh, depending on what the, the will of council is. Um, but certainly, I think the uh, there's a, a, an under option three not to proceed with the 315,000 in urgent repairs. Uh, and then there's also consideration under option five for the um, uh, use in the in the village planning process. Um, uh, that's kind of what I've been hearing, but I'm, uh, there's also some highest and best use consideration of perhaps both properties uh, within that, uh, or at least make sure that both properties are considered with the highest and best use within the village planning process. So I think what I'm just looking for here is, is there a desire to have staff come back with a revised analysis of what could be done uh, for remediation for a shorter term, say two or three years? Uh, okay, and maybe that would guide the next decisions in terms of what, what comes forward. There may not be any other decisions made at, needed at this point until we have that information. Yeah, go ahead, Councillor Braithwaite. Would that, would that not be included in the highest and best use, um, uh, that, that um, evaluation of the costs for a short term? I don't think so. I think the highest and best use looks at completely like the overall use of the land and what it could be used for. Um, the, what we're talking about there is just what is the cost of doing the bare minimum to get through the two or three years versus the 10 year or longer uh, remediation that's that's part of that so I think if we're 
if the, if the general feeling here seems to be not to go down the 10-year path, given that we are probably looking at changing it, that we should probably direct staff to come back with options. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Appleton. Uh, if I may, Your Worship, uh, just a, a motion that sits outside of the options, just for Council's clarity, uh, that I would move that staff be directed to prepare a revised estimate for residential resident renovation costs for 1538 Monterey, commensurate with a short-term lease that integrates with the village planning process. That has probably a timeline alignment with the village planning process, is that it? Correct, Your Worship. Okay. Second, second uh, for conversation. I, I take it you wrote that down before you said it, did you? I did, Your Worship. Do you want to just read it again so Mr. Uh, Coates can type furiously and uh, have it up on the screen? Can you just read it aloud? Absolutely, Your Worship. Uh, move that staff be directed to prepare a revised estimate for residential renovation costs for 1538 Monterey commensurate with a short-term lease that integra ind integrates with the village planning process timeline. Well, he's typing. I think we all heard it and understand it. Mm -hmm. Is there any debate on that discussion? Mm -hmm. uh, um, I just have a question. And you, I noticed that you used the words short-term lease and you did not indicate whether it would be for... Um, uh, for a uh, nonprofit or for market value, and is that is that the intent? Okay. Go ahead, Appleton. I think I'd, 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 I would not wish to limit it to one or the other, but I think my understanding is, and, and I can be corrected by staff, but my understanding is is that the residential renovations are required, whether or not it's nonprofit use or market use. Essentially, that's that that stage. You go ahead, Councillor. Sorry, <coughs> Councillor Smart. Oh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to comment on on the conversations that are going to be happening with the province over the likely the next. Six I will call it option study for the two properties. We have the, uh, the ability to complete that while we're having these discussions because we would not want to go ahead. I do not think to renovate the property without the certainty that the province wasn't going to have a conversation with us about municipal owned land and housing. Go ahead, Councillor Appleton. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate, thank you, Your Worship. Appreciate Councillor Smart's comments. Just to be clear, this is sort of an, an additional motion existing outside of any of the options here, so we can still explore any of the other options that have been presented by staff. And, and certainly this would be to prepare a cost estimate so that we have an understanding of what that more constrained uh, residential renovation would cost. Um, right at the moment, you know, our, our all in cost for the essential uh, upgrades and the residential rentals is at the moment 315000 So I think I, I would not purport to <laughs> estimate on behalf of staff, but if that comes back and is 100000 well, then we're have potentially having a conversation. If that comes back and it's 305000 then that's a different conversation entirely. So I think having that number for the basis of discussion, I, I completely agree. All things should be on the table, um, having a sense of what that number looks like. And, and I, would, I would encourage and I would support other motions out of the existing options to explore. I'm also in support of the highest, highest and best use study um, and also approaching nonprofit organizations as well. So. Go ahead, Councilor Smart. Uh, could I please just, through you, Mayor, have clarity from staff of how soon we might be able, understanding how busy staff is, how soon we might be able to see those revised renovation costs? Would they potentially come to our next council meeting? Uh, Mr. Graham? Go ahead. Under promise over deliver is all I will say. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's exactly what I was going to say. Um, I would want to talk to the Intercultural Society uh, to get their appetite on whether they would be able to uh, use the house for the period of time as well. But I, I suspect we will be able to bring it back for the next council meeting. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And, and again, I think the motion that's on the table is, is independent of the uh, of, of who the renter is. Uh, so I think that's the question is just can we have the the cost estimates back. Uh, in the, by the next council meeting, Mr. Graham. Uh, I can certainly have uh, Class D estimates back by next next council meeting. Okay, thank you. So the, that may be the best course of action is to, is to have those consideration and then re, and then reopen the debate on the balance of the items. Uh, Councillor Appleton, do you want to add anything else? 
Thank you, Your Worship. Appreciate your indulgence. And based on the discussion that just happened, I, I did want to point out that uh, in a brief discussion that I had um, with somebody uh, who, who has been, had involvement with uh, the, you know, the, uh, the ICA and the rental of the other property, I did make the point of pointing out to me that um, it was not necessarily guaranteed that that the Intercultural Association could necessarily take this on. That's a conversation that's yet to be had, and, and they did make a point of pointing out to me to say that may not actually be an option. So I think it's good to not limit it to one particular organization. Granted, that has been the, the organization that we've had the most dealings with of late, but that it, it was brought to my attention that that may not actually be feasible for them. Don't see any other discussion on the motion. The motion is there on the thing. Um, staff, you'd like to prepare. You've heard it. You can see it. There's no other discussion. I'm prepared to call the question. I am going to suggest, uh, no, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed? I'm going to suggest, given the answer that was given in the timelines for an answer back on this one, that we might consider any other options within the, within the, within the cost estimates of that. Um, but it's, if this uh, body wishes to give some additional direction on, on other aspects of, of that, that may be worthwhile. But I'm cognizant of the fact that even if we gave the go-ahead at the next council meeting, there's several months of work ahead of to do the renovation work. They're probably not extraordinary given those those realities. Um, so I'll just leave it to the board, or the, sorry, to the council, whether or not you feel like there's a, some additional direction that is worthwhile giving at this meeting. Go ahead, Councillor Appleton. Just following up on that, Your Worship, I guess then I would put place a question to staff. Um, I've heard general support for the highest and best use study, um, and so I'm just wondering whether staff could comment on whether or not there's any benefit to council affording the direction at this at this point for the highest and best use study, or does it make a difference to wait until afterwards, or is there is there any significance to us moving that forward at this stage of the game? Would that make life easier for staff if that was the direction of council? I'm looking, nobody wants to see me to answer that question on staff, so I'll give it to Ms. Williams. Thank you, Your Worship, for that introduction. Um, with respect to the highest and best use, I think the piece of information that staff would be looking for from council is what designation do you want the individual to use to assess the highest and best use? Is it the current designation of single family dwelling? Is it the village area plan as it exists today? Or does council want it to be considered as the village area plan as it might exist in a few years time? So I think that's the, the question we would need a response to and, and then through that we could fit it into a process. Go ahead, Councillor Appleton. Get my head around how they could possibly do option number three on that one. Go ahead, Councillor Appleton. Thank you very much, Your Worship. And I think Ms. Williams has, has hit on you know one of the questions I think that's circling around the council table, which is to say, if it was to uh, fit a highest and best use study was to fit with a prospective future village plan, what components would that include? I, and I don't, I don't want to create work for staff, but I guess then my follow-up question for uh, for staff as far as resourcing and how it would come about is. What is the feasibility of providing council with a certain degree of options analysis around what that the village plan might elicit for that property? Um, and I know that's an extraordinarily wide open. I, I'm not sure whether we can even have that discussion. So, but uh, would I ask for staff's comments to the extent that they feel like they can. I, I Ms. Williams, I'm going to give this back to you. I think uh, Councillor Apple's kind of hit the nail on the head here in terms of the the issue with asking questions that we don't have the answers to, but go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, I think absent council and the community's input into what that would look like, staff would be very reluctant to bring uh, bring forward a proposal. Okay. Uh, I mean, I might just make a suggestion here that let's see if this is even, if a short-term thing is viable, it may end up coming back at 250000 and we may not be having that conversation and... and we may want it. anyway. I think uh, my take on this one is we may want that piece of information before we move forward. Um, but that's uh, any other discussion or, or suggestions on this one? Go ahead, Councillor Watson. Uh, yes, just kind of to recap, I think what I am hearing is that the uh, village area planning process is paramount. 
and it will be the thing that helps drive our decision making around these two pieces of land and so it just speaks to allowing staff to continue with the priorities that they've already set for that exercise in my view so that we do get it out of the gate and start working on the on, the, on those policy options for the for the village so I think that's what I am hearing and uh, both from staff and from my council colleagues. Can I just ask a question of staff on that point? Um, I do, the report is not completed yet. It's coming to us in, in another month or so. Where is the, um, do we have, a, are there going to be options in there for, say, considering prioritization of specific areas uh, in the village area planning, i.e., uh, you know, say, targeting the village where we have these properties and may have a more urgent need than some of the other villages, or is a consideration of all things together at a high level and then d diving down into some deep dive? I'm just curious about what options might be available to us as a council if we wanted to, say, um, prioritize or fast track certain areas that we think have the highest uh, highest and best use, to use a previous term. Mr. Bull? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, um, well, the village areas planning, the village areas, multiple, is, is going to be, yeah, it's, it's quite a big project. It covers public space, the land use designations, different areas throughout the district. So uh, um, I think um, in, in the in the project sign-up document that we're going to prepare, um, there will be options and different components uh, separated out from each other. Uh, both to facilitate any changes that might, we might learn of over the summer, but also to give uh, council an opportunity to, to uh, yeah, maybe choose priorities or, or combinations of items. So uh, it, it sounds a little bit high level because we haven't really done that quite deep dive yet, but it is a very um, wide ranging project or almost a program. So that definitely will offer opportunities like that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Smart, and then I think, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I just wanted um, to comment with regards to the options study. Um, ha doing work like this every day, it, like you can look at a piece of land um, and you can provide options in isolation, looking at the OCP, looking at the council priorities. I, I think that we could give a simple direction as how could these two properties uh, contribute to solving our housing crisis. It could be a quite simple envelope that we could put forward that would give us a lot of relevant information going forward with our urban village plan. Thank you for that comment. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Patterson. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Mayor. And I guess following up on that comment, if, if because everybody around the table, I think except for me, has been talking about highest and best use. Certainly when you talk about a high, highest and best use when it comes to housing, it's high-end market housing, computed best uh, residual value <laughs> of the land. But I, I, I think in terms of local government, it's, it's really not highest and best use, but the most productive use of the land in the interests of the municipality. That may be housing, it may be other municipal operations. Uh, it, it leaves the door open. So I'm, I'm just, um, I'm concerned about focusing on the term highest and best use, particularly if you want to use any real estate consultants because, I mean, that's such an obvious one. They, I, don't, I don't think it would take them very long to, to determine that you, you go to, um, luxury condos and you will you'll produce the best valuation so it it really is about the most productive use of that of those pieces of land for the overall well-being of the community longer term i think that's an excellent point to be made here as we consider future options for it unless there's any other motions to give direction i think we're ready to move on past this item on the agenda so councillor upton just a procedural question, Your Worship, and maybe staff are already on top of this, but I just note that obviously under option two, which has already passed, we've di uh, direct staff to uh, rescind the rezoning of the property. So the rezoning is currently paused. Um, the, the existing resolutions directing that urgent works and residential renovations are actually still on the go as of right now. So I don't know that whether or not this process uh, essentially gives staff enough direction to understand that that's not going on anymore uh, pending the re the revised estimate or whether we actually need a procedural motion to uh, pause those renovations at, for the time being. I don't know whether that's actually necessary procedurally. Uh, no, thank you for, for raising that, Councillor Appleton. Uh, Mr. Graham, perhaps you would know probably best the status of those of that work that's under underway. Is it something that requires some direction here to give a pause? 
Uh, through your worship, I'll let uh, Mr. Coates comment on the the official process. But quite frankly, I had put it on pause a couple weeks ago, just based on the uh, the lease coming up available. Um, I didn't want to spend money if it was unnecessary to do that. So we've put the rezoning on pause as well as the design uh, and engineering on pause. But I've only put it on pause. I think can we continue that pause without a motion here, and given that it's coming back in a couple of weeks, Mr. Coates? Oh, your worship, just just for council's uh, clarity, so the the resolution that staff be directed to pre prepare a revised estimate for their residential renovation costs, uh, we, I would consider that to have superseded and replaced that existing direction. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. It's always good to be procedurally correct. All right, I don't see other pieces coming up on this. So thank you very much everybody for that conversation. We are moving into a series of uh, two uh, bylaws and permits which do not relate to public input. So we'll get to those uh, toot sweet. We have first Parks, Recreation and Culture, Fees and Charges. I believe we have Mr. Meikle online uh, to speak to us today. Is that correct? I see him on the screen, so I'm going to assume yes. Uh, Mr. Meikle is our Director of uh, uh, Re Parks, Recreation and Culture uh, and is responsible for all things Park, Recreation and Culture in the community. Uh, welcome, Mr. Meikle. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Just confirming you can hear me okay? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, this is uh, returns. Uh, it had uh, first three re readings on uh, May 23rd, and uh, I'm just available for questions if there there is any. Uh, there are no direction to cover anything more that hasn't already been covered. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Meikle. I have a. Do you have a question? Uh, just a quick question. There's a comment in the in the report that speaks to rates not changing since 2013. Is that is that a correct statement? It seemed like we've we've made modifications somewhat in the last 10 years. Was that just a typo, or is that actually true that we haven't adjusted our rates in that time period? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, it's true for one of the categories of our rates. Our admission fees, our single admission fees, and our pass rates have not changed in in a decade. Uh, because at that time, when the last increase happened, uh, we were at the the very upper. We were the highest priced uh, recreation services in the in the region. So decisions were made at that time to hold uh, admission fees at where they were at where they were. Uh, we have there has been adjustments to rental fees and to program registered program fees in in that time frame. So you're correct. It's uh, should have been specified. It's not a blanket statement on all of our fees. Okay, thank you very much for that clarification. And I guess the only other question I would have, is there any, um, I recognize that Sanish is probably raising the rates again in September like we, that we are considering. Um, I'm just, I, perhaps perhaps some explanation as why we wouldn't match at least Sanish's current rates, or is that just deemed to be too high? Too, and I apologize, I, f I forget the rationale for the, the current setting of the rates that are being proposed here. Um, but can you just explain why we wouldn't match the current rates of Sanish, which is our closest a comparator in the region? Sure, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, mostly because it, that would be quite a large jump uh, for for citizens at this point, uh, it, particularly in the price range of some of our passes. Uh, our pass rates, our annual pass, for example, um, is, I believe, about $120 cheaper than Sanich right now. So it would be a huge jump in that that realm. Uh, we went with 4% uh, increase, uh, give or take a half a percentage due to rounding, um, just based on what we felt the market could uh, tolerate at this time and and in comparison to keep us sort of middle of the road uh, in the region in terms of uh, those admission rates. Uh, part of that is, again, as we mentioned, because we haven't raised rates in, in a long time that uh, we felt it better to do some incremental changes at this point. Okay, thank you. Uh, last question on this one. Are those rates proposed in here and anticipated to meet their revenue uh, revenue targets set within the financial plan? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, that is part of the other consideration and uh, we did uh, the best we could in terms of projecting uh, growth rates in participation as well as factoring in that increase in prices. So when you put those two pieces together and uh, you know our projections for our growth rate and what we've seen continuing to to grow since the uh, end of the pandemic, uh, coupled with this uh, price increases, 
increase certainly gets us into um, the ballpark, so to speak, into the area where we feel we need to be for the financial plan goals. Okay, thank you for that. I think um, I, I missed the original conversation that got to the to the adoption portion of this. I think I probably would feel comfortable with a slightly higher increase, uh, but given this has already gone through three readings and is sitting in front of us, I'm not so horrified by it that I'm going to suggest that it gets changed at this point. And I do appreciate that we're doing a more comprehensive review this year to look at our, our fees overall. But I would say that 4% over 10 years is a very small increase uh, <laughs> by any measure. Um, any other discussion on the adoption of this? All right. Uh, oh, sorry, I just need a motion to it, motion for adoption. Moved and seconded, thank you. Uh, any other discussion on this? All those in favor? Any opposed, none opposed, that carries. And moving on to 10.2, up and setting and design for uh, uh, advisory for 2547 Nottingham Road. I believe we do have members of the audience that are here for this. Uh, so, Mr. Muller, please uh, go ahead and provide the introduction. Thank you, Mayor Council. Uh, the district has received an upland siting and design guideline review for the construction of a single family home, accessory building, and subsequent landscaping for the property located at 2547 Nottingham. The property is located within the uplands on the corner of Nottingham and Dover and is zoned RS2. This 12,292 square foot lot currently contains the original home that was built in 1956. Um, which will be re relocated uh, to allow for the siting of this, the proposed single family home pending the approval of the uh, application. The construction for the roughly 1,600 square foot bungalow style family home, or the, the, the application includes the construction of the roughly 1,600 square foot bungalow style single family home, uh, a roughly 600 square foot accessory garage and studio building, <clears throat> the installation of various plantings, a new driveway with access onto Donningham, fencing, sidewalk, patio, pool, and water feature. Uh, Prior to Council's review, the application was brought to ADP on May 17th for their comments, and that's included in this report. And staff have reviewed the, the development and found that it conforms with all the applicable bylaws. Thank you very much, Mr. Muller. And just for the information of the applicant, uh, I am happy to invite uh, you to come forward and make any other additional comment. I will say this is a fairly straightforward application, so we may just, if there's any questions of the of the uh, of Council to the applicant, we'll we'll go there. Uh, unless you, unless the applicant really wants to speak to it, but I think we'll probably go, okay. We'll go with questions uh, to staff or the applicant, and then we'll move on to resolutions. Go ahead, Councillor Braithwaite. Um, thanks very much, Mayor. Um, yeah, I think this is a very reasonable design as well, um, I, and I, uh, at the appropriate time, I'd be happy to move it. I do have a question, though, in regards to an arborist report, um, whether there was supposed to be an arborist report attached to this, and I thought normally on new builds within the um, uplands that we did have a, um, an arborist report to look at as well, and so I'm just wondering if that was missed or if there was not one needed in this case. Mr. Muller? There was an arborist report done, just not attached to this uh, report or package. Yes. So I, I, can you, sorry, Mayor, um, ahead, it, 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 would it be, um, usually in the arborist report we can see how many trees are being taken out, how many, and what the um, canopy coverage is, et cetera, and so do you have that information? Yes, we do have that information, yes. Uh, on, on me on hand right now? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, no, I don't have it on me. Okay, thank you. Are there other... Uh, Councillor Watson? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Through you to Mr. Mueller, put, Mueller please. I do have a question. Um, uh, since I was unable to attend the ADP meeting, the Advisory Design Panel meeting, I just wonder if you could clarify their comment or recommendation about moving the fencing. Um, uh, be pushed back in the front and side yards. I couldn't really understand that from the drawings or from a site visit, so I wasn't quite sure what was being requested or suggested there. If you could just comment, please. Yeah, those comments were directly related to uh, Attachment 7, the landscaping plan. Um, that include the, the outline of the fence on the property. The ADP felt that the, if the fence had been moved back on no, uh, Nottingham and on Dover to be in line with the housing, that that would be more in keeping with the open park-like feel that is characteristic of the uplands. And if I just could follow up for clarification, was it the uh, aligning with the rest of the housing on those roads or this particular site? I still couldn't follow along what they were asking because it looked like it was certainly aligned with the individual building. But <laughs> Mr. Muller? Mm -hmm. Yes, it would be aligning it with uh, the house on at 2547 Nottingham. So the houses on either side do not have fences on their front properties. So. 
And I'm, I, and go to, I'll go to Councilor Smart, and I might just invite the applicant. If, they, if do you have the answers related to any sort of free removals? Okay, so we'll come back to you. Go ahead, Councilor Smart. Uh, thank you. Through you, Mayor to staff. Uh, just to further clarify, then, um, were the APC's comments also related to these, what I would call a more decorative, um, staggered fence um, that is in the front yard, as well as the property line fences? Thank you. Uh, correct. It was specifically to the fence that was along Nottingham and uh, along Dover. So the you see in attachment seven, you can see it in the landscaping plan um, that there's a pool fence, and th those comments were not aligned to that. Thank you for that clarification. I go, can you, Councillor Smart, and we'll go to the applicant. Uh, I, I just need uh, further clarification then. So the the staggered um, fencing that occurs in in front of the property and and. Um, kind of scissors throughout the landscaping was not part of that recommendation? The, um, if you're referring to, is it along Dover and Nottingham? Um, there's a, like the, are you, are you saying scissors are staggered like as in the, the design of it? The Go ahead. So I, I, I see potentially that there are fences along the property lines, um, along the lot lines um, that extend past the face of, of the houses. There's also additionally a fence within the landscape um, that appears to be a low fence that may be three to four feet uh, tall. It, it may be stone in nature and it, and it, um, uh, it, uh, it it's more of a decorative fence within the landscaping. And so those seem to be, I just wondered if it encompasses both of those two very different fences. Yes, I, I, would, I would believe it does. They, they spoke of an open corridor of, of greenery, so um, no obst uh, obstruction of any kind. With that, I'm going to invite the applicant to come forward, if you don't mind. And uh, just there's sort of two, two primary questions here, and I don't think they're major ones, but probably good to get clarifications before we get to motions. One is we can just identify any trees that are being removed or replaced in the course of the uh, 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 build. And second, maybe you could, we, we have pictures but it's kind of hard, to, I think, a little bit to make it. It looks like there's sort of a, a half picket, half stone, and then it transitions to a stone fence on the on the property line. Perhaps you could just give us a, a, a verbal overview of what's happening here on those two pieces. Yeah, thank you, Worship and Council. Uh, my name is Robert Blaney. I'm the principal designer. Um, and just a side note, we did have the opportunity to design next door at 2777 Dover as well. So the two adjoining properties have been designed in correlation with one another um, very, very strategically uh, with, with both owners uh, being part of that conversation and both landscape plans being designed by the same landscape designer, Rob Spitz. So intimate knowledge of both properties has been taken into consideration. The tree canopy coverage, uh, both proposed, um, just quickly to note on that, uh, proposed uh, will be with new and existing trees at 74%. Um, we are only removing three trees on the south side of the property. Uh, I don't have the exact number of trees, uh, but I believe it is north of 20. Uh, and we are keeping the amazing Uri Oak trees as part of the setting for this home. This home was um, uh, encouraged by the homeowners to have a very English kind of countryside feel. And that park-like setting was the ideal scenario for this type of architecture. The fencing that we have strategically placed on the site is transparent in nature, and it is not supposed to impede the architecture of the residence itself. It is supposed to be an additional uh, architectural design element to create that kind of English country feel. So the one facing Nottingham is a picket with a, uh, a rock column um, as a support. So we don't have the exact height, and I was looking for that landscape plan, but we do presume it's about three to uh, three and a half feet tall. Um, and then on the corner, it does go to a solid uh, wall that does um, on the on the corner kind of follow in a in a square pattern and then goes to a uh, more of a landscape tree planting. But at that point down uh, on Dover, when it does abut 2777, we have put a picket, a that it is part of the approach as you walk up to the front door we wanted that picket kind of like um, symbolism and psychology as you went up there there was recommendation to push it back behind the building um, but with the planting currently that has been approved at 2777 Dover it it, it would not have made a difference uh, here or there so we decided to to keep it thank you thank you for that explanation it's very helpful any other discussion or questions of the applicant or staff? 
Thank you for being here tonight to answer questions. Um, thank we you. We have uh, two pieces. The, move uh, receipt. Move receipt, thank you, and seconded. Any discussion on the receipt? Moved and seconded. So this is uh, citing and design approval. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Braithwaite. Um, thanks. I'd just like to thank the, um, the applicant for building such a, a a sensitive to the to the neighborhood um, size house there because often in this neighborhood we get very large houses and I find that this is really sensitive to everything else in the neighborhood and so I thank you for that. Thank you, Councilor Braithwaite. Well said. All those not familiar with the discussion, happy to call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. As this is a setting and design, the approval now is what matters. There's no additional. A notification or other processes attached. So, building goes ahead. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Councillor Braithwaite, and then Councillor Smart. Um, thank you. And just, um, just wondering if, um, when another, um, when other applications for the Uplands come up, if it would be possible to perhaps have the arborist report attached to it. Um, just because for for me, I like to see the number of trees that are being removed or the canopy. And so, if we could, that would be really great. Thank you. Plus, it saves us from asking questions. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead, Councillor Smart. Uh, in respect of the ADP's um, uh, guidance and recommendation, I would like to move their additional uh, motion with regards to the application. Um, and I'm not sure if, if staff has um, any recommended rewording or if it would be moved as per their recommendation. Perhaps you just reference what page that is on. Um, so that is on page uh, 3 of 34. Um, that the application be approved as is with the consideration that the fencing be pushed back in the front and side yards along Nottingham and Dover Road to be aligned with the home, leaving a clear and unobstructed yard maintaining the park light setting. I think that motion should probably have come prior to the, the main motion, but I'll see if there's a seconder uh, for the recommendation. Councillor Watson. So before I go any further, I just, I'm not sure I understand procedurally here, we've just passed approval of the uh, siting and design as was laid out here. How do we go back and consider any revisions? I guess we can go ahead, Mr. Coates. Oh, Your Worship, that would uh, be a reconsideration by council for, sorry, unless uh, the ruling would be that it's a motion arising. But it's, it's it, it would seem to be a, a revision to the plan, and therefore that council would have to uh, reconsider the motion and then uh, make an amendment. Thank you. And just for my reminder, because I don't remember, uh, I'll take it as a reconsideration motion. That's in order because the motion is is from someone who voted in the in the majority. So, uh, but the reconsideration motion uh, requires is it a, just a majority, simple majority to reconsideration. Your Worship, that's correct, yes. Okay. So before I consider the main motion, I'll have to consider a motion for reconsideration. So if this reconsideration motion passes, then we will consider, we'll, we'll open the debate up again and we'll consider some uh, amendments to the to the motion at this point. Uh, so at this point, I'm just going to do, treat it as a, as, a recon, as a reconsideration motion, not the motion that's been made. So instead of putting the motion made aside, because it's sort of out of order procedurally, and we'll consider... Uh, the reconsideration motion. Um, is there a debate on reconsideration, Mr. Coates? Uh, yes, there is. Okay. So you're making the reconsideration motion. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Smart. You may want to motivate on this one. Yeah. Um, um, we have uh, design guidelines for this area, and we have um, a commission that looks at uh, these guidelines and advises us um, on whether or not they are meeting the intent. And in this case, our experts have told us that um, th the existing fencing is not meeting the intent of these guidelines, and I respect their review, um, and I would like to take that into consideration. Uh, 
Is there other discussion on the, on the reconsideration motion? Go ahead, Councillor Braithwaite. Um, thanks, Mayor. And um, I, I, I'm, I'll be voting against the reconsideration. I think that the explanation that the um, applicant put forward in regards to the fencing satisfied what I would like to see on that property. And from the diagrams that I looked at, um, I couldn't see a, a big issue with that. I understand that we have the ADP to give us some, some help in that regard, but the, the final decision does rest with us, and I feel that the applicant gave us a good explanation on that, so I'll be voting against the reconsideration. Any other discussion on the reconsideration motion? Go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I'll be voting against the reconsideration motion, and I guess when I look at this, and I, I did take note of the comments by the the ADP, but it, it did state that the application be approved as is with consideration for other things, and I think that is not unusual for the ADP that they they recommend approving it as is, and they may ask consideration. Sometimes that may be um, used to to change the plans, and sometimes it isn't. So, but they did state that it be approved as is. So, I am I'm taking their guidance on it to be absolutely as they have stated it verbally. Thank you. Hey, Councillor Smart. Yeah, and I just wanted to clarify, I am moving it as, as written, as, as, as is with consideration. All right, but they, the motion right now is for reconsideration, so we won't consider any amendments until unless the reconsideration motion passes. Any other discussion on the reconsideration motion? Go ahead, Councillor Appleton. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I think I would probably just indicate that I wouldn't vote for reconsideration at this time, um, just essentially along the same comments as, as Councillor Patterson. Um, I think it's something to, I think, I don't want to speak for the ADP, but what I gather by the ADP's comments is, is that that's something that council could mm -hmm. consider taking up or not taking up, depending on what the input from the applicant has, and the applicant has taken the time to come down and explain the rationale for why it was implemented that way. So I'm, I'm happy to let the existing decision stand. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Apple, then. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Watson. Yes, I just wanted to comment, sort of, um, uh, in my uh, on an apology. Normally, I would have been at the meeting, and I would have been able to hear in more depth what the ADP were concerned about, and I, I don't have that context, which is why I wanted to sort of support the reconsideration. But I do think that uh, uh, maybe uh, the applicant is here. They've heard those remarks. They've seen the report, and that is probably sufficient. I appreciated that them filling us in on, uh, on what is intended. Um, uh, but I, I, I do want to uh, recognize that the ADP did take time to look at this and, uh, and brought their professional expertise to the table. So they did have some grounds for making the comment in the first place. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I, I just think when people vote against, they should make a quick comment. I'm basically going to make a comment. I'm not supporting reconsideration, just because, purely for the reasons like everybody said, but particularly Council Appleton, I think, articulated it the best for me. Um, I, I think we asked the question that the applicant consider the fencing be pushed back. They've considered that. They've given a rational explanation that satisfied my piece, so I don't feel like that has to come back for further consideration. I feel it's the, the request of the panel has been met, and therefore uh, I'm not going to support the reconsideration at this point. I'm going to call the question on the reconsideration motion, which is all those in favor of reconsideration? Councillor Smart. And those opposed? As I read it out, Councillor Watson, Appleton, Braithwaite, Patterson, and Murdoch opposed that reconsideration motion fails. Uh, I appreciate the, uh, there's never any harm, uh, much rather to deal with the issue at hand than go away thinking, oh, I wish I had addressed that in the meeting. So thank you for that. Um, that does wrap up that motion that <laughs> item now. <laughs> Put you on the edge of your seat there for a moment. Um, we now move back to, I believe, the last piece for public input, which is the Council Procedure Bylaw Amendment. Uh, this is Bylaw 4740.003-2023. Uh, Mr. Coates, uh, we've had three readings and we're here for adoption. Is there anything you wish to put forward at this? Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, uh, members of the Council. So, uh, yeah, you Council has given three readings uh, to this bylaw, and as the report uh, attached to the agenda noted uh, when it was originally received by Council, that bylaws of this nature have a statutory requirement in the community charter to give the public an opportunity to comment on that. So, uh, in keeping with that, staff uh, undertook uh, advertising of this proposed amendment, and this was the amendment to the start times for your meetings uh, from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. and uh, from 5.15 p.m. for uh, closed meetings to 6 p.m. for those. Um, uh, there has been no feedback received. 
and so council's free to consider uh, adoption of the bylaw all right we've talked about this quite a lot so uh, I don't see any other public input at this uh, attached to this report so it's essentially the, pub the public feedback has been non-existent is that is that the fair way of, ex of your worship that's that? correct there was no uh, no submissions or feedback received by staff okay go ahead Councillor Appleton thank you worship so just to confirm with staff if, if this is adopted at this meeting it's in effect as of next meeting oh good question and uh, mr. Coates you had some thoughts on this I think uh, your worship uh, and uh, through you to Councillor Appleton for the questions so uh, there is a requirement in the in the charter to uh, pr to provide to publish notice of council's meeting schedule so with this being a change of council's meeting schedule uh, we are required to give that notice again uh, with the revised times and so from a perspective of meeting the the what we would consider the statutory obligations as well as a, a heightened level of transparency we would undertake two more uh, notices to that this that to publish the new schedule with those meeting start times and then uh, that would see the meetings uh, start at 7 p.m. in July thank you I don't see a lot of discussion so perhaps Councillor Appleton you might want to move the, uh, the motion to adopt move adoption your worship is there a seconder thank you moved and seconded any discussion or debate go ahead Councillor Braithwaite um, thanks so much. Um, sadly, I was um, away, um, or I, I think uh, my connection when I was away didn't allow me to participate in this part of the um, of the discussion when you had the first three readings of this. Um, I, I have been pretty consistent in my um, in my opinion on this. I and I, and I understand why it's come forward because I know that um, that some people feel that they have that we would get a lot more public participation if our meeting started at seven o'clock. I'm I'm thinking that we probably won't. Um, I think that having no public input throughout the, the period um, what, that we were looking for public input is an indication. Um, I think that, um, you know, it's obviously we had our used to have our meetings start at seven in the past and I've, I've gone through four terms where that happened or three terms where that happened so I'm, I'm quite um, aware of the time uh, constraints around the, the around the um, 7 p.m. start I, I worry that when I look at the number of meetings that we've had over the past term or that even the past little while since this term started um, I think we've had 50 percent of our meetings have gone over the three hours if we're not starting till seven o'clock at night I don't know how we have an expectation that people around this table are going to be able to stay and 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 have um, you know effective conversation around the table after three hours and getting into almost 11 o'clock at night and also for staff too I worry about staff having had worked here all day and then having to come back and be on point and answer questions all the way up until 11 or 12 o'clock however long the meetings go my hope is that we can shorten our meetings and get all of our business done in three hours but if we don't which has been how it has been in the past then we run the risk of of not being able to make good sound decisions around this table and that worries me um, I'm okay with not having the um, the uh, the in camera portion at this at the same time I'm I'm happy to do in camera whenever but for me personally I think that the six o'clock start has been good because normally we're finished before nine o'clock um, and um, and and you know or we can be finished before nine o'clock and that makes for good sound decision making if we're not starting till seven we're not going to finish till ten or after ten I think that is hard and on the mayor as well and a mayor has made often makes a comment on how after a certain time time period it's hard for him to chair a meeting after three hours or four hours so I think I'm going to have to vote against the adoption, um, and even though I understand why my colleagues want to want to move it forward, but I just want to. I, I mean, again, I hope I'm wrong. I hope our meetings can stay short, but um, I, I will. I guess time will tell, and I guess my question will be, what happens if our, our meetings do go end up being longer, and we find out that we made a mistake? Is there a process to then go and turn it back to six o'clock and then then what does that do to our public input because then we've really confused the public from going from seven o'clock to six o'clock back to back to seven o'clock back to six o'clock so I'm anyhow I'm voting against Fair enough, Councillor Braithwaite. Uh, I do know that uh, just catching this before I go any further we do have uh, open to public uh, input on this item so I do want to make sure if anybody from the public wishes to address us again if you're online you can hit star nine to raise your hand or if you're in the meeting here if anybody here is here to speak to this item 
and now uh, we'll do that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have council pat. We don't usually debate a lot at adoption unless people have changed their minds on these. So I just uh, want to give some. Yeah, I will know that we're 22 we minutes ahead we of have my spent, usual schedule. We have spent so much time on this, and really, I, 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 it's not that I, I, I pose it, it. It's more tell me the time and I'll be there. Um, but it does get confusing. But I think in, in, in response to Councillor Braithwaite's points, and I, I think the, the points are, are well stated. Um, the option is, if the meetings run on, that without unanimous consent to extend, the meeting closes and the business gets carried to another meeting. And, um, and that is exactly what will happen. And if that means we have to go to four meetings a month instead of three, then so be it. But we will we'll find that out. Thank you. I don't see other discussion on this item. So I'm going to call the question on adoption. All those in favor? Any opposed? Councillor Braithwaite opposed. That carries. As of July, it sounds like, we will be meeting at 7. I just want to raise, there's a, um, uh, in our agenda package, we have 11.3, the development variance permits with variances at 2024 Oak Bay Avenue. I understood this was not happening tonight, but is it carrying forward tonight? I just see members of the audience. Are you here for that item? Oh, okay. <laughs> just making sure we're not leaving... Sure. So I'm I'm happy to, uh, frankly, uh, so that's uh, the chair's discretion as to whether I have public input. So I'm happy to invite public input for that item. Absolutely. So no, nope, thank you. It's kind of an odd little conversation with the audience, but it's a small audience, and we're we're all here. Uh, so with that, then we're moving on to that item, which is uh, twelve point one. Uh, this is a uh, came under a notice of motion, and uh, for the University of Victoria lands at Cedar Hill. Um, I'll provide, if, if there's, I think probably procedurally I'd rather, I, I'm happy to move it, but if there's two members of council happy to move and second it, we'll go with that. It doesn't go on the record, moved. Is there a second or moved and seconded for the <coughs> those pieces? Thank you, that's on the table now. Um, I will invite the members of the public up to speak. So if one of you wants to come up and now, I'll just give a quick preamble in terms of where this is coming from and why it's in front of us here. Um, so, uh, as noted, uh, in the, there's an attachment here with the um, uh, University of Victoria's uh, June 2023, so very, very new uh, real estate strategy uh, they just published. Cedar Hill Corner is one of three properties that they've listed as priorities for development or redevelopment by the university in the uh, short to medium term. In my conversations with the university staff, it appears they would like the OCP to be clearer about the type and scale of development the district would support. The university has preliminarily identified they're likely designed to be along the lines of a mixed-use university district, that's their terms, with a mix of medium density housing and retail commercial. Uh, this motion would have staff come back with estimates of time and cost to undertake an OCP revision process. This process would allow the district to engage the public on a vision for those lands, including housing and commercial potential, but also looking at environmental, natural space, public space, and other priorities that might guide future redevelopment. As I understand it, staff will explore possible alternate funding sources to assist this work to minimize impact on current priorities, um, but that'll come back in the options analysis. If this is successful, uh, this process, it could both meaningfully speed up development of this land, and I'll note that the land was originally intended to be developed in the early 1960s, and provide a district-wide input and visioning process to guide that development in accordance with community vision. In speaking with staff, there are a few other possible minor OCP amendments that would also logically be included for public input uh, if this does move forward, which is why the options analysis includes that option in the motion. Uh, that Those are unrelated to the UVic lands, but, but you know, if we, we have to go through a public process with an OCP review, so it made sense for other minor ones to be considered by council as well. I think that's pretty much the sum of the of the background for it. Um, uh, so, are there any questions from council? And then I'll go to questions or comments from the public. Yeah, go ahead, Councillor Smart. No. I just wondered uh, if we open up the OCP for this area, if it might um, be advantageous to include just an overall urban village center discussion for the Henderson area that may e extend all along Cedar Hill Crossroad and, and not just this site, uh, because I expect that the community consultation um, 
may may extend beyond this area, and, and that, that might be a more fulsome discussion. Sure, thank you. I have no personal objection to that. This was really a response to uh, Uvic's comments that they were going to do this, but there wasn't the process attached to the sort of visioning piece. So, like everything else, it has the pros and cons of the more the bigger you make it, the more complicated it is, and the longer it takes, and the sh the smaller it is, the less you, options you have uh, to consider other options. But it often, it's a faster process. So. I will take the direction of, of council, but it's entirely possible that that options analysis could include, you know, both. Uh, and if you know, with that might provide some examples of timeline changes between the two. Um, and I could certainly look at some suggested wording on that if that was the will of council. Uh, council Appleton. Thank you, Your Worship. And this is uh, going to sound like a bit of an obtuse question coming from our council's UVic liaison, uh, but. Just with respect to the, now that the University of Victoria has communicated this re university district uh, real estate strategy uh, to council, it now enters the, obviously in the public domain because it's entered, uh, you know, into our council package. I haven't, um, th this is new to me since our last meeting as UVic liaison, so I'm just wondering, and I don't see any um, uh, official announcement, or this would seem to be to be the kind of thing that might have some media associated with it. So I'm just wondering, this might be a question for you, Your Worship, as to whether or not UVic had communicated that they were going to publicize or otherwise, you know, communicate to the public at large that this is something that they were contemplating. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. The uh, the last conversation I had with them, this was they had no public plans pieced out there, just some conversations happening in the in the back, looking at their development pieces. So I, I, I'm a little surprised to see that this, this developed, but it's I think it's also helpful to help guide our our understanding of what the potential is in the in Saanich and Victoria around the Uvic lands. Sir Watson. Uh, thank you, Mayor. This is a question to you, uh, maybe also for a comment, and it follows up on Councillor Appleton's. Um, uh, remarks. I, I just looking at their strategy, um, they've prioritized the Ian Stewart complex, and it seems in terms of their comprehensive planning, and it seems to me, given their some of the things they seem to be signaling in this, that if we took these actions now, they might not even have capacity to pay much attention to the exercise. And I just wondered if you could f f comment on that given you may not know much more than what's in here. but um, Yeah, I'll be careful about what I say on this. I think that the U university has very limited staff for planning. Um, and my understanding and conversation with them is that they've had to kind of determine what and if they can do. So I think your read of that in terms of the prioritization of the Ian Stewart complex is a bit further on and it's a bit clearer development piece, so they're, they're more actively engaged on that side of the equation. Um, that being said, uh, they have also closed this land down to public access, and so its community benefit as a dog park and for general recreation is now no longer available to the public, and uh, so part of the rationale here is the simpler we make it and the clearer we make it possible to consider talked about hiring best use earlier today, um, options that might go there and have that community really, I think OCPs tend to not, aren't that specific typically, but there are sort of values discussions around how do we protect the environment if this was to go forward? How, what was the what sort of mix of, of residential and or commercial would be appropriate for that space? What does it serve? Um, do some exploration of the capacity of the area for, for infrastructure and so forth. Those are all things I think that could provide some some needed baseline information and some comfort with them that they could move it forward. And I think, I think with that, it, it, it provides the opportunity for maybe maybe moving that along a little bit faster. And as I note, this really was scheduled to be built in the 1962-ish time frame, and uh, it was put on hold when the land was was gifted to the Hudson's Bay Company from the Hudson's Bay Company to the University of Victoria, uh, with no conditions attached. Um, the OCP amendment might also help guide that development in a way that is more broad than just in, just university use. University use by itself uh, doesn't provide a lot of control over what might go there. It's very vague. Um, and I'm hoping that perhaps if it's redeveloped in a way that's, con you know, 
consistent with community use and, and adds some value, then we may actually get some tax revenue out of that space as well. So I think all those pieces, to my mind, make it worthwhile to at least remove any barriers on our part and perhaps provide some incentive for them to move it forward. Go ahead, Councillor Braithwaite. Oh, thanks so much. I think that, yeah, I think reading this um, and, and listening to what Councillor Smart was saying about expanding it, I would almost say, you know, it would. I would prefer to look at a, a smaller, uh, the way it's written right now, rather than expanding it only because um, for t our staff time and um, and probably the cost as well of doing something like that, of, of expanding um, the, our OCP. So I, I'm torn on that as to whether to expand it or not, but I, I think I would lean towards not expanding it. Thank you. And, and in fairness, I'm torn as well, because I think that there are other places that perhaps commercial might make sense in that in that area to serve North Henderson. Mm -hmm. And there's probably other places that some additional housing forms might look at. Um, but at the same time, I think we can probably move a, a consideration of OCP. This is such a unique space. It backs onto a very, very environmentally sensitive area. It's traditionally had public access that I think is, has an expectation within any changes on there. Uh, and it's tied directly within the university and can be bridged directly into the university core that provides us a very different use, perhaps, than some of the other pieces. So I, there's pros and cons to both. I, I moved it forward in this way, really trying to speed up uh, the university's options, at least, to look at it and, and make sure that we're, we're, we're helping to guide that discussion, not just sitting back as a passive partner. Go ahead, Councillor Smart. Yeah, thank you, and I appreciate the simplicity of it, and I think maybe maybe it's inviting partners to the table. I guess I particularly just look at the, the, the school district site and the church site um, and wonder what their future plans might be that might relate um, to the site from a neighborhood perspective, and I just think that might come up when we have community consultation. Yeah, I appreciate that, and, and it may be worth well worthwhile for those entities to sit at the table with us and maybe raise that during the process because I think that it could be beneficial. Um, okay, so the uh, the motion is has been moved and seconded, but uh, certainly not uh, anything move, else move forward on it for discussion only at this point. I do we have members of the public that are here to address council. Mm -hmm. So with council's indulgence, I think it's time. You've been very patient waiting in the audience for the entire night to get to this one item. So please come forward. The process is very simple. Uh, we just ask that you give your name and municipality of residence, and uh, you're free to address council. Uh, you have to push the button in the middle to turn it on, and we are ahead of schedule at this point, so ask that you don't speak more than, say, an hour or two, and we'll be fine. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Yes, my name's Brian Tang, and I am a resident of the District of Oak Bay. And uh, I ask you to consider why Oak Bay is opening the OCP. Well, the current OCP recognizes the university land as an area that the district will support the university in implementing its own development plans. And it's my understanding that the property was purchased from the Island Broadcast Company as it was formerly a tower, communication tower site. And then that happened in 1964. And the property has a clean title, as far as I know, without any registered agreements for housing. And I, from what I understand, it wasn't a Hudson Bay company. Uh, it was the Island Broadcasting Company that had clear title. And they sold it to the university. So the land is not vacant and supports a variety of uses, including research, te teaching, and athletics that have popped up some before while well, it was used as a dog park. and. Uh, and some new ones since that was closed to public access. Uh, and I believe that the land is not a quick answer to meet the goals of the Housing Supply Act, and that the university's mission owes a duty of care to their students, and there remains countless opportunities for public housing initiatives that council has more influence over. And I would say that reopening the OCP will serve to strain staff resources when they should be used to implement the Housing Supply Act in a manner consistent with the current OCP. The UVic campus with its 20,000 students and 2,000 staff maintains a campus plan built on its own community engagement framework and I identify this to be outside of that community engagement framework as uh, their own uh, direct link to Oak Bay Council wasn't used in its uh, capacity. 
in this. So I feel it's a sort of backdoor approach. And we only found it on the, like on the agenda meeting minutes uh, from May 23rd, which didn't get us much time to respond. And so it's my thought that the Cedar Hill Corner property has no existing amenities such as sidewalk, bike lanes, or public transport, or sufficient utilities in the area and infrastructure, and that the current OCP identifies density and development in the existing village centers, commercial areas, and multifamily areas that have the supporting amenities. The motion before you calls for creative development applications, and I ask why we're looking for creativity when we already have a completed framework in the existing OCP to use sound judgment and strategic planning to facilitate sustainable growth and meet the needs of the Housing Supply Act. I encourage Council to reject this motion and allow staff to focus on the continued implementation of the current OCP and already identified strategies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. I'm assuming other people here would like to speak as well. No? Okay. I'm, I'm then I'm going to make the assumption you're here in support of the person who just said. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I'll make the call as well. There's, there is one phone number I don't recognize online, so again, if anybody wishes to address council at this point, it would be star nine to, uh, to raise your hand within the application, although I've made that call already, so I don't anticipate that'll come happen. Uh, so we come back to this table then at this point for consideration. I, I just, I, I'm, I should probably feel comfortable, I should probably just address some of the comments made, and I, I, I appreciate you raising them. I, I don't know the history of the tower site. My understanding of that was that it was it was a use consideration, but that the Hudson's Bay land did include that. But I could be wrong on that portion of it. I do know that the uh, the community plan back in the in that 60s development did include uh, some multifamily along Cedar Hill Cross Road along the, all the lands that the Hudson's Bay Company owned. So um, it's a bit irrelevant at this point, honestly, in terms of what those original plans were. They're they're long lost, um, and. Uh, yeah, I think those are those pieces. I think I just should make clear as well, if this motion passes, uh, and we'll have a debate on that in a moment, um, this does not move it forward. It basically, we, our process here is that we want to make sure when we're making decisions, we understand that, that decision within the context of all the other priorities and staff limitations and, and costs and so forth that we have. So as this wasn't part of our strategic planning process, um, the motion here essentially goes to the staff and says, what does this look like? What does the staff impact? What would the cost be? What would the process look like, et cetera? So it, it brings it back to this table for consideration of it. It's not a, let's go do it at this point. It's a, it's a staff consideration. So just to give some some clarity in terms of what the process looks like if, if this does pass here today. So with that, I'll come back to this table. Uh, is there any other discussion on the motion that's, that's here in front of us? Go ahead, Councillor Appleton. Thank you, Your Worship. Just briefly, I, I, I'm in support of what's being presented here, uh, in part because, um, you know, as, as you spoke to, there's a, an interest and some clarity on behalf of you, Vic, as far as, you know, how land use could potentially be managed. I think that it would be my hope that through this process as well, if, if we do engage in this process, that it would also be educational and informative for the community, uh, because I know that many people many people are, are interested and have asked questions since the discount you you know since that has been closed to the public so i mean i think people are aware of the the fact that it's been closed to the public and people have had concerns about the loss of the dog park and sort of what it will be at this stage of the game there's a very large question mark hovering over that property and what what it will be and 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 frankly uh, quite a lot of um uh lack of understanding on behalf of the community about where Oak Bay's jurisdiction may may begin, what Oak Bay's role would be versus the university. All these things, I think, would require clarification with the community. So I would hope that the community, if this if this proceeds forward, if council in the future decides to you know respond to this with a, with a, an OCP review and a discussion on the OCP, that it would be educational and, and give the community a possibility, you know, an opportunity to key in with that process. Because right now it's just essentially a, a question mark. There is no clarity around what that will be people don't have an opportunity to weigh in on it either. So that's that would be my hope. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Braithwaite. Um, thanks. I, I'd agree with um, Councillor Appleton's comments, and, and, and I'm comfortable 
moving this forward based on your comments as well in that um, w what we'll look for is what comes back from staff to see if it can fit in to their timing and and the cost around it as well so so I would be comfortable um, moving that forward too. Mr. Smart? Um, yeah I'm also um, comfortable with the motion from the from the same conversation that we had earlier tonight um, about looking at options would also include the option of leaving things as is, but we need to look at all options. And I really appreciate um, the clarification around the land is not vacant now. And and I think one of the most you know important aspects of this study would be to look at the value of what is there now and what it brings to the community. And I would expect that to be a significant um, aspect of this. Thank you. Don't see a lot of it. Oh, go ahead, Councillor Watson. Thank you, Mary. Yes, I support the the direction here. I think it's a very I think it's a very important piece of land for the university and for the community more broadly. And uh, uh, given that UVic uh, is now sort of bringing in capacity and uh, starting to think about these things more broadly themselves for their all their overall real estate strategy and campus use, I think um, it would be helpful and uh, show leadership from us if we actually proceeded to do something right now um, to help advance that process or support it. So um, I will be supporting the, the, the motion to request staff to think about what that would involve for us uh, so we have more information. Thanks, Councillor Watson. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Yes, thanks, Mayor. I, I too will support the motion. I think it it's better to um, be proactive and think about some of these things in advance so that we can be effectively engaging in the discussion. And it has been, you know, getting close to a decade since the OCP was done. It's not inappropriate that we have a check-in with. Uh, with what our goals are and I think further to what um, Councillor Smart talked about is you know it, it isn't just vacant land and as we heard from the members of the audience it's not just vacant land and um, it is a natural space and it is appropriate I think to to have the discussion well in advance so that we can frame um, what what our goals and objectives are and be able to contribute meaningfully to the conversation, whether pro or or against. So I think it's appropriate we, we undertake um, an analysis by staff. Okay. Uh, I think everybody's spoken here. I've already had a chance to give my preamble and answer questions, so I don't need to speak again. So I'm happy to uh, call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed, not opposed? I should probably ask, do we have a sense of timing and when this might come back? Mr. Bull, is it weeks, months? Do we have a sense? If you don't know, don't promise anything at this point. I, I my sensation, my sense is that it might take a bit of time to come back with it. But um, do you know? Yeah, yeah Mr. Mayor, um, I'd like to make sure that it fits with uh, any other of the new initiative uh, impact assessments that might be pending. Okay. Um, so um, I need to uh, confirm that with my colleagues and uh, Fair. yeah, look into the timing of it on that basis. Sure. And, and for anybody in the audience who wonders why such a vague answer, generally speaking, the reason for this process is that we often have really lots of ideas at this table and they often don't go anywhere. So staff typically don't even look at uh, motions or that are coming from council until the council has endorsed them and then they start doing the analysis of it so that we don't spend time on things that are just ideas popped around but not actually have support. So uh, I appreciate that you don't have the answer to that question here. Um, with that, we move on to 13. Is there any new business? And then 14, which is adjournment. Move adjournment. Moved and seconded. Thank you. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Tang and group, for coming out tonight and sharing that thought. Uh, that will help us as we consider how we move this forward. So, all right, everyone. Thank you. And for those online, thank you very much. And staff, have a good evening.